In 1980, the federal government provided almost $16.5 billion directly to county, municipal, and township governments. By the end of the 80s, that figure had fallen nearly 40 percent, with the federal government requiring local authorities to offset the losses. Local governments have had to provide their own funding for basic government services, such as police and fire protection, education, and health care. On October 22nd, Congressman John Conyers introduced the Local Partnership Act of 1991. The bill would authorize the federal government to make partnership payments totaling $14 billion over the next five years. The payments would be allocated directly to the 39,000 local governments, and each entity would be able to spend the money for its own priorities. The bill would target funds to the areas that are feeling the worst effects of the federal shortfall. The bill's distribution formula also earmarks more funds to those governments that have imposed high taxes relative to their residents' incomes. Coming up next, we take you to Capitol Hill and today's hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee. You will hear from local officials from throughout the country, including mayors, town supervisors, and city council members. The meeting is chaired by Congressman John Conyers, a Democrat from Michigan. Good morning. The Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations is now in session. When I assumed the chairmanship of this subcommittee in 1983, the very first meeting we had was on the General Revenue Sharing Program. In a series of hearings over the next three years, we heard from dozens of public and private officials about the importance of this no-strings program, first introduced by a Republican president, which is then being used to deliver vital police, fire, sanitation, health, and education services across the nation. Many of our witnesses painted a pretty gloomy projection about curtailments of federal aid, including the loss of general revenue sharing. They spoke of lost jobs, deepened recession, cutbacks in services, and higher local taxes. Sadly, the feared federal retrenchment of the 80s continued unabated and deepened a national recession we are all too familiar with. To the surprise of only the White House, the gloomy projections of the 80s have now turned into the stark reality of the 90s. Against this backdrop of deep recession and federal cutbacks, local governments have been fighting the uphill battle to provide even the most basic services for their citizens. Yet, despite their best efforts, almost every community has faced increased local property and sales taxes and slashed vital services, including police and fire protection, education, and health care delivery. The legislation we are to review today seeks to reverse Washington's abandoning of local governments and our citizens. Chairman Conyers' bill would reinstitute a fiscal relationship in support of basic service delivery and I applaud his critical effort. In real terms, the debate is going to be whether local governments will be able to maintain a reasonable quality of life in their communities if the federal government continues to shirk its role in the intergovernmental partnership. As we will hear later, the chairman's bill is not strictly a reauthorization of GRS, but it will face many of the same arguments we met in previous years. Some will argue we can't afford it, to them we must say we can't afford not to. Some who otherwise espouse flexibility in federal programs will now argue there is no accountability in the Conyers bill. To them we must say let the cities and towns and counties decide their own highest priorities. Some will argue that the distribution formula is askew. To them we say suggest a better alternative. And some will argue that this is simply a federal giveaway let us begin with these hearings to remind them of the dire straits our constituents already face and the high federal taxes which they already perceive gains them little return. I welcome all of our witnesses from around the country and look forward to their testimony. I know what a difficult job they all have back home. There being no objection, it will be my intention now to yield the gavel to Chairman Conyers, who's the not only the author, but the driving force behind this legislation to proceed with these hearings. Mr. Chairman, the gavel is yours. Thank you very much. Is that in the record for 
Without objection, uh, we'll put in the record uh, Craig Thomas of Wyoming's uh, comments about the bill. And I want to begin by thanking Ted Weiss. Uh, we remember uh, revenue sharing. We've got a new title now, the Local Partnership Act. A, uh, a hearing on this measure today is a result of two previous hearings on urban problems in this country that have already been held by the Government Operations <coughs> Committee. Uh, our witnesses uh, today uh, are going to tell us what's really happening and how we can be helpful. Uh, there are three major points. The local governments throughout the nation, from rural areas to large cities, are under fiscal siege. The federal government's policies during the past decade uh, are in at least some way a, re a cause of the local fiscal problems. Uh, in 1980, we provided $16.4 billion directly to county, municipal, and township governments. <coughs> and the third reason is that the, the major reason for the decline in federal payments to local governments was the demise in 1986 of the, the measure that began in 1972, as Subcommittee Chairman Weiss referred. Uh, this law was commonly known as revenue sharing, uh, distributed uh, $4.6 billion to 39,000 local governments. Now, <clears throat> I am very encouraged this morning because members on both sides of the aisle have praised the effectiveness or potential effectiveness of this new measure. And some remember uh, that the 1972 law wasn't so bad either. And uh, we've had a, a vigorous bipartisan effort, and we think that we may be on a new mode of moving to, a, to solve a very important problem. We're building on the strengths of the 1972 law, and I think that you should know the Local Partnership Act makes two changes in the allocation formula in order to get the funds to the local governments that need them. We add an unemployment variable so that the larger partnership payments will go to local governments in the states that have above average unemployment. And secondly, we remove the old ceiling that restricted the amount a local government could get no matter how a, a desperate it was. So we've uh, removed the, the uh, floor uh, and the ceiling from the old law. Some people may argue that, that this bill is going to break a budget deal or that uh, we're going to cut other vital federal programs and we want to entertain all these discussions. Uh, uh, we've canvassed the Government Operations Committee and we find that there is a very reasonable view uh, about uh, supporting this bill if we can explain to everyone that, first of all, the budget deal says that the uh, domestic appropriations pot is $198 billion. And so uh, one way we can do this is to find the financing within the, the, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, a source of money. The uh, second uh, is to uh, break down the walls between the domestic spending and the third of course is to uh, declare uh, an emergency. Uh, we, uh, we think that we can explain a way to at least get this legislation started uh, by looking uh, within uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and fund the $2 billion that is called for in 1993 out of the $14.3 billion NASA appropriation. We think this is uh, uh, a friendly and a uh, uh, good way to do it. There may be difficulty down the road five years from now. If anybody can, 
knows what's going to be happening five years from now, uh, wonderful. Uh, I can't tell you that. And there may be circumstances that none of us uh, can predict. So let's just start off with the immediate circumstance. And uh, I'm happy to see uh, two of my colleagues, three of my colleagues here. I'd ask Tom Foglietta to join his colleagues uh, uh, up here at the table. And uh, let, us, let us begin with uh, our colleague on the committee, uh, Ray Thornton of Arkansas, a distinguished member of the committee. And then we'll go to uh, the uh, chairman of the Urban Caucus, Tom Foglietta of Pennsylvania, and then my dear colleague, uh, a, f a neighbor from Detroit, Mrs. Collins, pardon? Oh, are, do other uh, members have any comments to make about this bill that, that are sitting here? Mrs. DeLauro, you do? All right, let, let's recognize you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, do, uh, to discuss what is without doubt one of the premier problems confronting our nation, uh, the decline and the decay of cities. Uh, what were once the centerpieces of our society, places that really dazzled and amazed us with their innovation and their excitement, are now places of danger, places to be avoided, and all too often scorned. Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you and Chairman Conyers for your leadership in producing this legislation. The Local Partnership Act of 1991 could dramatically improve the health and well-being of urban America. Our cities are in serious straits, and this legislation represents a significant step toward providing the essential assistance necessary <coughs> to, rec to really to rescue them from the brink of disaster. The act also represents a serious departure from recent federal policy toward our cities a policy that can be best described as no policy at all. Since 1980, the U.S. government has stopped spending and sending general revenue sharing assistance, cut back on vital economic development grants, and retreated steadily from providing essential housing assistance. This anti-policy is in no small way responsible for the dire state of affairs that has consumed our urban centers. It's difficult to appreciate the importance of this legislation unless we understand the detrimental impact the federal policy of the past 10 years has had on our cities. It is a policy which has aggravated a vicious cycle of flight and poverty. As the rate of violent and drug-related crime increases, every citizen is threatened. As poverty increases, so do the incidences of disease and infant deaths, homelessness and drug abuse. With each rising negative statistic, we witness a corresponding <coughs> decrease in the number of businesses and taxpayers remaining in our cities. And each additional departure exasperates an already desperate situation. My home, New Haven, Connecticut, is no exception. It's a city that I represent, and it's the seventh poorest city in this country. At one time, New Haven received in excess of $50 million annually from federal sources, money that helped with police protection, road repair, housing, health care, and job training. Today, that money has great, been greatly reduced. In 1980, federal aid to Connecticut municip municipalities stood at about $200 million, while revenue generated from property taxes was, was about $1.3 billion. By 1990, federal aid had increased only 14 percent, while local tax revenue had increased over 112 percent. In 1980, federal money represented 7 percent of the budget of Connecticut municipalities, but by the end of the decade, this share had dwindled to 3.5 percent. As the federal support was removed, the city stumbled under the combined weight of uncontrollable national economic problems, unpredictable epidemics and drugs and crimes, and unavoidable federal mandates. Cities like New Haven were forced to cut necessary police protection, drug enforcement, or health care facilities. Dramatic cost-cutting procedures were introduced, including workforce reduction, the elimination of services, and often with no other resource available, tax increases. In response, citizens who could afford to move did, leaving the poorest to pay this increasing burden, only beginning another revolution of the cycle. Now, as we reflect on 10 years of malignant neglect, of our anti-urban policy, we see how short-sighted we were. Our former centers of industry and culture are now war zones. You are more likely to hear gunfire from an assault weapon than the work whistle from a steel factory or jazz from a nightclub. 
I believe it is possible to revitalize our cities, but it will demand a significant shift in federal policy. We must offer assistance instead of mandates. The Local Partnership Act of 1991 represents an important step in the right direction. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and Chairman Conyers for the significant uh, contribution that you've made to this urban uh, debate. I look forward to the witnesses. It and if I it. might, Mr. Chairman, put into the record uh, the statement of uh, Mayor John Daniels, Mayor of the City of New Haven, who was invited to come here this morning, uh, but who couldn't. And this is a mayor who's struggling with trying to keep his city afloat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I should point out that uh, Rosa DeLauro is a valued member of the Human Resources Subcommittee, as Chairman Weiss has reminded me. Let's recognize the ranking Republican member from Wyoming of this subcommittee, Mr. Craig Thomas. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to be late, and I appreciate you putting my, my statement in the, in the record. I'm very much interested in, in this issue. I'm very much interested in hearing from, from the, uh, the witnesses here. I uh, need to say a few things realistically. It's fairly easy to talk about how we need to fill all the problems and take care of all the gaps, and that's who's against that? The question is, where are you going to get the money? And what are we going to do to have revenue sharing? Are we going to continue to have categorical grants to various places and yet do revenue sharing at the same time? I don't think so. I worked yesterday with uh, a committee here to try and change a categorical grant to our state so we could use it the way we wanted to. It happened to be in health. But they don't want to do that. They want to continue to insist how it be spent and yet spend some more on top of that. We're all dealing with a deficit. And I think it, uh, it's sort of posturing to talk about how we're going to do these things unless you come up with some willingness to do something. You either have to raise taxes, you either have to cut out some other expenditures, and you can't take it all from defense. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, acknowledge the merit of this, and I want to hear about it, but I, I have to say that it's easy to get up here and talk about what you're going to do uh, about it, but let's come to grips with some of the issues that are really involved. And that's where are you going to get the money? Where are you going to reduce it? Are you going to raise taxes right now? Furthermore, I'm in favor of reducing taxes on the federal level and letting the local jurisdictions set their own levels. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to it and I appreciate your having the hearing. Well, I, I think I read some uh, agreement about the need that we agree on. The question is how do we realistically come up with the appropriation behind a good idea? And that's a, a challenge that we're always confronted with. I'd like now to recognize uh, yet another member of this subcommittee, the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Bernard Sanders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know a few months ago we held a meeting here in which you had uh, managed to get the General Accounting Office to review the Canadian health care plan, and I think that that was a major breakthrough in terms of forcing us to deal with the health care crisis in a sensible way. And I think that what you're doing today in terms of proposing legislation for what might well be the most critical issue facing this country, and that is recognizing the absurdity and the horror of the federal government continuing to turn its back on the cities and towns of America and recognizing the enormous problems that Mr. DeLauro and others have talked about of what's going on in urban America and in rural America. And I think the pitch that I would like to make is that while sometimes we see the problems in urban America very clearly, and those terrible stories are on the front pages of our papers, I would urge you, Mr. Chairman, not to forget that in the backwoods of Vermont and in the backwoods of rural America, we have similar problems that also uh, must be addressed. Uh, Mr. Thomas raised a very fair question, and he said, where are we going to get the money? We don't want to hear just speeches, and he's absolutely right. We all recognize the problem is there, where are we going to get the money? And I have to tell you, as the only independent in this Congress, and somebody who does not believe that the Congress or the Republicans or the Democrats or the President are doing a good job, I was delighted yesterday by something that happened. And that is, finally, on the floor of the House, the House of Representatives made a very important decision. And Pat Schroeder deserves a lot of credit for that. She stood up there and said that at a time when millions of our children are hungry, five million of our children are hungry, when in cities throughout this country, kids are not getting the health care that exists in third world countries, 
when the wonderful Head Start program that has succeeded all over this country is underfunded, that maybe it's about time that the Congress started dealing with some hard choices. And I'm very proud to say, as you know, that the House voted very strongly yesterday to put $1.4 billion into programs for kids. I see that as the beginning of an effort, and I hope we continue that effort right now. Mr. Thomas raised the legitimate question, where do you get the money? And you cannot discuss this without addressing that question. How do you spend the money? He's right. Let's talk about the reality of what goes on. In the last 10 years, the richest 1% of the population in this country has seen a doubling of their income, and they are paying less in taxes today than they did 10 years ago, and cities and towns all over this country are rotting because the federal government has cut back on revenue sharing, community development block grants, urban development action grants. So I think that the Congress should make a choice. Is it appropriate to see the richest people become much richer while our children sleep out on the streets? Or do we finally say to the wealthiest people in this country, the party is over, you had a good time for 10 years, we have seen your big stretch limousines and your yachts, but now you're gonna have to pay your fair share of taxes. Okay, let me conclude. And the second area is that when the children goes hungry, go hungry, and the cities rot, we spend $290 billion a year on the military. So I would conclude that there is more than enough money to deal with the urban problems, to deal with our rural problems, to protect the basic interests of this country. The only criticism, Mr. Chairman, that I have of this wonderful proposal is I think we've got to start spending a lot more money. Two billion is a good start. I would raise it significantly more. Let's get moving and I congratulate you for calling the hearing. Thank you, Bernard Sanders. Uh, we'd like now to see if uh, the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. William Zeleff, uh, has an opening comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a very, very important uh, meeting, and we thank you for holding it. Um, I have always believed that the closer to the people the tax dollars are spent, the more effectively these tax dollars will be utilized. People back home are far better able to establish their spending priorities. Congress has a dismal record in setting spending priorities and solving problems. Our state and local governments have by far a better track record in meeting the needs of all their people than Congress does. They know better than Washington does what the real local needs and spending priorities are. So the concept of local decision making and setting spending priorities makes sense to me. But let's face the facts. We cannot afford to send big, big bundles of dollars to our local communities without cutting spending someplace else. We have a responsibility to let the states, counties, and cities set their own spending priorities. We also have a responsibility to fund this program by eliminating inefficient, ineffective programs that have not met the needs of our cities, towns, counties, and country. I have no problem setting spending priorities at the local level, but we must do it in a fiscally responsible manner. We must cut programs that spend too much money on the social welfare bureaucratic delivery system. We must get the money into the hands of the needy and not the bureaucracy. There is one area of the bill that troubles me. I'm talking about a funding formula that rewards big spending, big taxing governments. I'm talking about a formula that rewards those who impose an income tax at the local level. If we trust the local governments to set spending priorities, then we should also trust local governments to determine taxing alternatives. If Washington is going to tell local governments what tax alternative is best for them, we will soon go back to telling local governments how they can spend this no-strings revenue sharing program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to hearing the testimony. I'm sure that we will be uh, hopefully solving the issue uh, by testimony on both sides. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I'd like to go over that formula with you because uh, it's based on tax effort in the uh, in, in uh, allocations to the state and to the uh, allocations within the state, uh, the tax effort is a, a measurable item uh, that determines uh, the eligibility and uh, total taxes paid when we, when we make the first cut to the states. So that question of uh, who's uh, carrying their share of the freight in the beginning is a very appropriate one, and I'd, I'd like to Great. continue to examine it with you. I turn now with pleasure to Patsy Mink, the uh, gentlelady from Hawaii. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I uh, know that we have many distinguished speakers to hear from on this very important bill, but I want to take this moment to express my very strong support <clears throat> for this bill. 
In fact, it's probably next to the uh, bills that we report out on education and those items that we deal with for children. This is probably the most important bill that the Congress, I believe, will be considering in this session. Over the last 10 years, the federal government has foisted upon local governments an increasing amount of responsibility from providing public services to meeting the extensive provisions which have been handed down by the EPA and other elements of our executive branch. We've placed upon our local governments obligations on top of a myriad of other obligations which municipalities have traditionally had to fulfill. At the same time, we've turned our backs on municipalities by decreasing the allocation of funds and turning a deaf ear to their complaints and the problems that they have brought to Washington. It's long past time that we redress this situation. In 1975, our cities and counties were expected to manage our schools, establish and maintain our police and fire departments, oversee real estate practices, provide disaster relief and emergency services, fix our roads and bridges, and the list goes on and on. This constitutes an enormous amount of responsibility. As such, it did not make sense to cut funds in the first place, and that is exactly what we did. In 1980, the federal government provided $16.4 billion directly to county, municipal, township, local governments. By 1989, the amount provided by the federal government had declined by almost 40 percent to $10.1 billion. And while we were cutting their funds, we were making them our primary environmental regulators. Another example of the distorted responses to our nation's problems that we saw throughout the 80s. With this bill, we will rectify this problem by authorizing an appropriation of $2 billion in FY93 and an annual authorization increasing by $3 billion per year until it reaches $14 billion in FY97. With the money coming from the space station in 1993, Elimination of boondoggle defense appropriation funding, such as the B-2 bombers, the SDI, and the Seawolf submarines, we will be spending, I hope, through the enactment of this bill, for vital services that are close to the people at home. We will target it to the poorest communities so that the people receiving the majority of the funds are those who get it. It will provide localities with the autonomy to spend the money as they see fit. And they're the ones who know best. And we will extend the funding automatically so that no community will fall through the cracks. This is the kind of far-sighted legislation, Mr. Chairman, that the American people need at this juncture of the uh, history of this country. I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that my full text be included at this point in the record and that I may be able to submit a statement from the chair of the city and county of Honolulu Council endorsing this legislation and urging this committee to report it out expeditiously for full consideration by the Congress. Thank Without you Without objection, so ordered, and I, I thank you for your uh, very cogent uh, remarks. Uh, I'd like to inquire of uh, John Cox of Illinois if he has a comment before we begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, I, I simply want to commend you for proposing this legislation and holding this hearing here this morning. Uh, it's an honor for me to have had the opportunity to be one of the original co-sponsors of this bill, and I look forward uh, uh, to uh, uh, taking advantage of your kindness and allowing me to be uh, here this morning, although not a regular member of this subcommittee, to have the opportunity to uh, uh, introduce a very close and dear friend, the uh, Mayor of Rockford, Illinois, at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, let, let me begin with uh, Ray Thornton of Arkansas, our, our member, and then move to uh, Tommy Foglietta of Pennsylvania, the chairman of the Urban Caucus, and my colleague uh, from Michigan, 13th Congressional District, Barbara Rose Collins. Could you begin, Ray? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to compliment uh, you uh, and the other members of the committee on? for scheduling this most important. Uh, Ray, uh, is your mic turned on? Let me see. Uh, is it is, is it on now? Yes, sir. Very good. Mr. Chairman, I want to begin by thanking you for your leadership in bringing this bill forward. I'm privileged to serve as a co-sponsor. This legislation okay. uh, reflects the kind of leadership that is needed if we are to take advantage of the magnificent opportunity we now have as a nation 
to address many of our nation's needs in a comprehensive and interrelated way. The problems of our cities have been mentioned by many of the opening statements, and they are real. They are significant. They are drains upon our nation's resources, and they need to be corrected with this kind of legislation. However, there is more to be done, and this is but a part of the magnificent opportunity we now have to redirect our resources, to reprogram our efforts as a nation to address our problems here at home. Our nation needs to set out three goals, to remain the mightiest nation on earth militarily and to be the strongest economically in order that we can continue to be the greatest in terms of human <clears throat> dignity, freedom, and responsibility. Those goals have given, in recent years, have been given an opportunity for redirection of resources unparalleled in my memory. With the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, we have the opportunity of analyzing our situation militarily, economically, and in terms of human dignity to address problems at home, remain, remain, remaining as a nation, a, a country which is part of the world community, a strong and vigorous economic competitor. Mr. Chairman, national security <coughs> is based upon more than military arms. It is based upon an educated citizenry. It is based upon an infrastructure of human and physical capital adequate to sustain our country's position as the greatest in the world. We have a magnificent opportunity now that is unparalleled in recent years. The last time that the United States had an opportunity to set a sea change type of policy in effect was that that we experienced immediately following World War II. When Europe was crushed, when its cities were devastated, when the education of its people was in chaos, when its financial institutions had gone bankrupt. Does this sound familiar? Does it sound as uh, though it might be describing something that we have today? And at that time, our nation was head over heels in debt. We had a national debt of $260 billion and a gross national product of only $212 billion. Our debt exceeded our gross national product, but we did not consider ourselves poor because we were economically vigorous, because we had addressed problems of competition. Today, our economic situation is not as bad. Sure, we have a terrible deficit, approaching $4 trillion, but we have a gross national product of $5.5 trillion. And Mr. Chairman, last year, the United States of America spent $135 billion defending Western Europe against a non-existent Warsaw Pact. We have a rare moment in history in which we can address problems at home so that our nation can enter the next century the mightiest militarily, the, the strongest economically, and the greatest in terms of human values. And this legislation is the kind of vision and leadership that this Congress needs to develop. We need to be, de be developing a program for America as appropriate to our needs today as the Marshall Plan for Europe was at the end of World War II. At that time, head over heels in debt, our nation devoted 2% of our gross national product to rebuilding Europe. And it worked. Europe and Japan are eating our lunch today. And it is time that we make that same kind of commitment, that same kind of effort to rebuilding this country and making it possible for us to achieve our goals. I commend you, sir, for this 
thoughtful approach to addressing some of the most significant of those problems, the problems of our cities. And that is not restricted to the problems of our metropolitan areas. It includes the problems of a mid-sized city like North Little Rock, Arkansas. And Pat Hayes, the, the mayor of North Little Rock, will be here to give in detail the kind of purposes that can be solved by this legislation. But it also includes the problems of Perryville and Casa and Adana and, and minute villages in rural areas of our country where they have been strapped by requirements imposed by Washington upon their resources without a commensurate, flexible financial support to address those problems. I thank you very much for the privilege of co-sponsoring this legislation with you. Well, you remind me of your career as a head of a law school when you uh, make these grand historic sweeps that are very important in uh, helping us gain uh, the vision of what we're doing. Sometimes we work in the trenches so long that we forget to look up. And uh, I'm also inclined to report that villages are included in, in this partnership in act. Indeed they are. Uh, we need to, to let people know that uh, the smallest municipal areas are part of our revitalization yes, program. And, and the solution that you're bringing is vision and leadership, recognizing that an opportunity exists to address real human problems. And Mr. Chairman, an investment in human and physical infrastructure or capital is not an expenditure. When a new airport runway is built, it comes out of the budget as a one time expense item, but it's good for 50 years. And a road or a bridge is good for 50 years. And the education of a child is good for the child's lifetime. And these kinds of investments are what we must be making as a society if we are to achieve our national goals. Well, thank you very much. Let me now recognize a gentleman from Pennsylvania, Tom Foglietta. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, First, let me commend you <coughs> for attempting to tackle this problem, which is one of the most serious facing the American civilization. I thank you for inviting me to testify as you consider the Local Partnership Act of 1991. Okay, we'll squeeze him on. I sit here before you today as both the chairman and founder of the Congressional Urban Caucus and as the elected representative of Philadelphia, a city that is struggling with one of the nation's most publicized fiscal crises. Cities and the people who live in them are suffering. They suffer from crime, from drugs, AIDS, homelessness, and terminally sick healthcare systems. There are many other problems, especially racial tensions, over traffic streets, crumbling infrastructures, increased unemployment, dying small businesses, and crippling tax burdens. How did this happen? As the U.S. Conference of Mayors have told us, the, con the federal contribution to cities has declined by almost 63 percent. First, we lost general revenue sharing. Then the UDAG program was killed. Just as these programs were ending, the problems faced by cities were beginning to expand geometrically. And many cities are simply unable, unable to cope with the demands being placed upon them. Their resources are being stretched to their outer limits. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I support your action to bring aid to our beleaguered cities. And I'm pleased to see your commitment to reviving a targeted federal assistance program for our cities. In 1989, I introduced legislation to provide more federal aid to large communities like Philadelphia. My bill would have, would have revived the old revenue sharing program that was dismantled in 1986, providing cities with federal discretionary funds. In Philadelphia, revenue sharing represented an average of only 3% of the city's budget from 1972 to 1986, but it had a genuine effect on the amount of money that city could spend on basic city services. 
In 1986, $45 million the uh, Philadelphia received from the program translated into approximately 1,864 jobs. And it's no coincidence that this figure is so close to the number of workers the city has had to lay off in the years since that program was canceled. Your bill, like mine, improves on the old revenue sharing program by targeting the assistance to those area that need it most. The major problem with the original program was that the funds were distributed to wealthy communities that had no real need of fiscal assistance. The old formula was flawed because it put cities like Beverly Hills on the same footing as the city of Philadelphia. Further, large metropolitan areas received a disproportionately lower share of federal monies than did many smaller communities. This was wrong. Our cities desperately need a revived revenue sharing proposal. Revenue sharing is not a partisan issue. After all, remember that it was started by a Republican president, Richard Nixon. And in order to see it come to life again, it must be re supported by both sides of the aisle. I come here today also as chairman of the Congressional Urban Caucus. Our 75 member bipartisan organization was formed to draw attention to the current crises facing America's cities and to work on legislative solutions. Democrats, Republicans, members from the Rust Belt, the Sun Belt, and the Breadbasket have all come together to fight one common theme, to restore America's cities. We must come together again to craft a revenue sharing bill to aid these cities. We don't have a magic wand that we can wave and make these problems go away. But our cities need help. They need leadership. And they need it now. I pledge to help you to the further extent of my ability to enact a fiscal assistance program to help our cities recover from the malady that now faces them. Thank you very much, Tom. I'll be looking forward to your help. Congresswoman Barbara Rose Collins uh, knows about local government. She started with the school board. She went to the Michigan Legislature. She served on the Detroit Council. And uh, we're very delighted that she would join us here uh, as we begin uh, an examination of this very important measure. We welcome you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank you for calling this hearing today on H.R. 3601, which you sponsored. And I would also like to thank my colleagues on the subcommittee for presenting me with the opportunity to share my support for this vital legislation with you and to present to you some ideas for furthering the principles, goals, and body of this legislation. The question we are here to examine today, Mr. Chairman, is a question of precedent. As we all know, there has been a significant decline in this nation's federal spending programs over the past decade. Deterioration of funding at the county, municipal, and township local government level have probably hurt this nation more than any other factor. As members of this legislative body, we need to decide whether the time has come to advance this country forward once more with a financial boost to local economies or to continue to allow the monetary situation that has blighted this country for over a decade to continue unchecked. The bill we are here to address today will help us to make that decision. As an original co-sponsor of H.R. 3601, I will tell you, Mr. Chairman, that I have already made my choice. There will be many critics who will say, how can we possibly afford to give money to localities when we have a national budget deficit of several trillion dollars? I simply say to these people, we cannot afford not to help at this time. Our nation is confronting a crisis of epic proportions, a low dollar value, high unemployment, decaying infrastructure, a barely functional education system, and a degeneration of corporate America, among other issues. Without an injection of federal venture money, this country's economy will remain stagnant. I would remind this committee that following World War II, 
Europe faced many of these same problems, as my colleague Ray Thornton has stated, the same problems this country is now encountering. Both the physical structure and the economic base of Europe have been nearly destroyed by the war. The United States' response to Europe's near collapse was swift and it was decisive. The solution was simple, invest now for a healthy tomorrow. Nearly three years at the end of World War II, George Marshall, then Secretary of State, developed a plan for rebuilding Europe, which was implemented within a year's time. The Marshall Plan is considered by many to be this nation's most successful foreign aid program to date. Mr. Chairman, we're not here today to talk about a Marshall Plan for America, but we will be soon. Although we are talking about the same principle, invest now for a healthy tomorrow. <clears throat> We need to invest money in this country more than ever before. We need to sink money into spheres which include our nation's infrastructure, our schools, and our corporate base. The Fiscal Partnership with Local Governments Act of 1991 will allow areas which need the funding the most to begin investing in the locales which are in the most dire need of assistance. Congressman Conyers' plan not only distributes money to areas which need it most, but the formula created for the plan dispenses this money in a practical and effective manner. The bill meets the primary requirements for any future federal investment program. It asks for moderate amounts of money and it uses this money efficiently. We must ensure that any money which is allocated in the future is strictly tracked in order to prevent waste. This money must also be used in a comprehensive manner, tackling all of the needs of urban and rural areas, including problems such as revitalizing the nation's infrastructure, promoting education, protecting this nation's corporate structure, and strengthening law enforcement and improving health care services. Mr. Chairman, the city of Detroit stands poised on the edge of recovery. The growth of the waterfront along the Detroit River could be compared to that of Baltimore's Inner Harbor, or even that along the Potomac. The Renaissance Center, which rests at the river's edge, is indeed part of a renaissance for the city, a center for renewal and growth. Downtown Detroit is expanding, although the growth is sluggish. New suburbs are beginning to appear where not long ago there were closed businesses and plants or where there were entire neighborhoods which had been destroyed. However, the growth is something which can barely be seen. The city sleeps like a slumbering giant, ready to be awakened by the rattle of coins in the pouch. The coins in this case are an influx of money to the localities, which desperately need the boost to make the changes, which will count the most for the city of Detroit and other cities like Detroit, and rural areas threatened by needs similar to those of low-income urban areas. Without measures such as this, Mr. Chairman, I believe that lower-income urban and rural areas stand little or no chance for any short or long-term recovery. This is a modest proposal with the discretion of the use of federal money to be used at various local levels. I ask the members of this committee to help awaken the sleeping giant by moving rapidly on this urgently needed legislative pass package. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to share my views with you and with this illustrious committee. Might I invite all of my colleagues uh, to, uh, if their time permits them, to join uh, the committee at your leisure. And may I express our deep appreciation for your understanding and commitment uh, to resolve this problem. You've all put it in your own way, and I think it's very important that we uh, understand the premises under which we're operating and not dodge the difficult question of how we're going to fund it. Now, funding is, is what is the tail on every bill that we uh, pass. It's, this is not some uh, new characteristic that is now uh, cropping up for the first time. And, so we want to look at, at the financing formula, uh, the way we uh, appropriate the money. So we've learned something from the, the uh, revenue sharing bill of the 70s, and uh, I think that you put your finger on it. 
Uh, Barbara Rose Collins, I'm, I'm especially pleased that you would uh, move out here uh, in the way that you have, uh, especially in your first term in Congress. As you know, uh, the mayor of the city of Detroit, Coleman Young, has reconvened the tri-county mayors in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties in the state of Michigan, and they've already been examining this measure, so we're going to uh, probably take uh, Bernie Saunders' observation of how we use the general accounting office in the health care bill to bring to bear to analyze uh, city by city and county by county in this country the real need for this program and the formula that we put together with it. So I thank you all. I appreciate your comments this morning and I uh, hope that you will uh, be able to spend any time that your schedule permits with us. Thank you. Now, President Gerald McEntee of uh, AFSCME has, has uh, kindly uh, agreed to let me bring on some of the heads of these national associations, but he has a, a very difficult time problem, and we're going to accommodate it because I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. McEntee, that we uh, that we uh, move uh, move these uh, these mayors uh, <clears throat> up into a situation where we will stop their presentation to uh, to allow you uh, to make your time commitment. But we we do have uh, uh, the mayor the the. Uh, the representative of the United States Conference of Mayors here, uh, Charles Box of Rockford, Illinois, a mayor himself. We have uh, the representative of the National Association of Counties, uh, Marlene Eady of uh, North Dakota here. We have uh, representing the U.S. Conference of Mayors and National League of Cities, uh, Jack Norquist. We additionally have uh, uh, Mayor uh, uh, Gerald Borvrick, the supervisor of uh, Monroe Township, uh, Cardell Cooper, mayor of East Orange, New Jersey, uh, Michael Dixon, county manager of Ashe County, Patrick Henry Hayes of North Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, Saul Ramirez uh, from Laredo, Texas. And I'd like uh, to ask Al Bustamante of Texas and uh, Don Payne of New Jersey to to introduce uh, their mayors. Uh, uh, John Cox can introduce his. Uh, Ray Thornton has a mayor here. And uh, is uh, Mr. Kleska here? Jerry Kleska uh, has a mayor here. Uh, why, why don't you uh, all take a crack at one minute introductions so that we can hear them in time to get Jerry McEntee uh, on and off the, the uh, the witness stand. Uh, let's see. You want to do it? We should have, we have nine here, yo. Uh, Mr. Cox, why don't you begin and then followed by Mr. Payne, Mr. Thornton, Mr. Kleska, and Mr. Bustamani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think, Mr. Chairman, understanding the reality of the needs of local communities demands that we hear from people in the trenches, those who are fighting to survive with decreasing revenues an increasing demand for services from their constituents. One of those people in the trenches is Mayor Charles Box of Rockford, Illinois, the second largest city in the state of Illinois, the largest city in my district, the 16th Congressional District of Illinois. Mayor Box is an individual greatly respected by his peers, which is identified by his election as mayor of the city of Rockford in 1989. Uh, upon being elected mayor, uh, he was elected as chairman of the U.S. Conference of Mayors and just completed his service in that position and is now serving as chairman of the Committee on Community Development Block Grants of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, I believe, Mr. Chairman, that through uh, Mayor Box's uh, testimony and the answers to the questions that he'll provide, this committee will hear the truth about the immense problems being faced by the mayors uh, throughout this country. Mayor Box is an individual to whom I turn uh, on many occasions to uh, uh, provide guidance and information about the needs of the city of Rockford, which I uh, believe are uh, a very clear example 
of problems that uh, cities face around the country. And it's an honor for me to have the opportunity here this morning to introduce my friend, Mayor Charles Box, the mayor of Rockford, Illinois. Now he, he's come before this committee before. He's a familiar face in government operation. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me commend you for the introduction of H.R. 3601 and commend you for the outstanding work you've done so many years in this House. I would combine very briefly a, uh, a very short statement <clears throat> since I was not here at the beginning of the meeting and then introduce very quickly my mayor. Let me commend you for calling this hearing on the subject which is so critical to urban America. The weakening of federal support for our nation's cities over the past decade has taken a heavy toll both in economic and social terms. I welcome this opportunity to be a co-sponsor of the Partnership Act of 1991 and this opportunity to discuss the need to bring fiscal relief to local governments. The 70 percent cut in federal funds to cities since 1981 has had a grave implication as local governments try to cope with the growing demands for housing, health care, education, child care and services for senior citizens. During the 1980s, the problems of urban America were compounded by a number of factors, including the AIDS epidemic, the appearance of crack cocaine, drug-related violence, and a growing number of people in the homeless community. My home city of Newark, New Jersey, the largest city in, Newark, in, the, in our state, is struggling to meet the, these types of challenges facing American cities today. Under the leadership of Mayor Sharp James, innovative public-private partnerships have been formed to stimulate economic development and to keep the city moving ahead. However, stretched budgets are making it difficult to have human services, particularly in this long-term recession. Unfortunately, Mayor James was not able to be here today, but he has indicated to me his firm support of our efforts to alleviate the fiscal problems of urban areas through passage of the Local Partnership Act. I would like to submit for the record a copy of the statement provided to my office by Mayor James. Mr. Chairman, it is indeed an honor for me to introduce one of the rising stars from New Jersey, the youngest person ever elected to the mayor of the city of East Orange, and a man I am proud to call a true personal friend, Mayor Cardell Cooper. Mayor Cooper has, has a distinguished career in public service, holding the position of Essex County Administrator, Business Administrator for the City of Irvington, Essex County Freeholder, and Director of the East Orange Department of Human Services. The mayor has also received numerous distinguished service awards for outstanding community service. Mayor Cooper recently received a prestigious appointment when he was named by Governor Jim Florio as a commissioner to the New Jersey Sports and Exposition Authority, the administrative agency for the $435 million Meadowland Sports Complex. I know he will be able to provide the subcommittee with insight about the impact of diminished federal funding on the city of East Orange. It is a pleasure for me to welcome to the subcommittee my good friend and outstanding public official, Mayor Cardell Cooper. Thank you very much. Mr. Ray Thornton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The largest city in Arkansas, which is governed by a mayor, uh, city council form of government, is North Little Rock, Arkansas. The um, gentleman who now serves as mayor of the city of North Little Rock, Arkansas, is a former member of our state's General Assembly. He has proven leadership in the uh, uh, legislature of our state and left a distinguished career there to accept the challenges and responsibilities of managing uh, the uh, third largest city in our state, but the largest one to have an elected uh, mayor. I think the thing that sets him apart is his participatory leadership. I've had the privilege of getting in the car with the mayor and traveling uh, to the uh, city power plant, to the uh, garbage uh, and sanitation workers areas, to the uh, human resources areas, to other operations of the city and I have been amazed that he knows all of the employees, I believe, by name. Uh, I, I, I never saw him fail to come up with the name of a particular employee and the participatory uh, governance which he has uh, developed in that city is truly remarkable. 
I think it gives him a, an unusual uh, base upon which to provide testimony to our committee today as to the importance of this kind of federal support in solving the problems of cities. And I'm so honored to uh, present to the committee my good friend, uh, Mayor Patrick Henry, uh, Pat <laughs> Hayes. Gerald Kleska. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, although I'm not a member of the subcommittee, I do serve on the full government operations committee, which has jurisdiction over this subject matter. And I would like to, at this time, welcome all the mayors uh, to Washington and to this panel to testify. But I especially want to welcome my own mayor from the city of Milwaukee, John Norquist. John and I had the pleasure of serving many years together in the state legislature. Uh, sometime back in 1984, I was demoted by the people of Milwaukee and sent to Congress. John, in turn, was promoted and made the city uh, of Milwaukee mayor. Uh, and as mayor of the city of Milwaukee, uh, John has brought with him uh, innovation and hard work. His popularity is a tribute to his, cons his sincere concern for the city and his dedication to, the, to working with various levels of government, be it local, state, or federal, demonstrates his resolve to administer effectively public policy. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised when I heard that uh, Mayor Norcus was coming to Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that I didn't sign on to the bill, but nevertheless, uh, and <clears throat> if it has, it still isn't going to work. But I do welcome the mayors and, and my mayor, John Norquist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, Mr. Al Bustamani, a valued member of Government Operations Committee, Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and let me just praise you and thank you for having this hearing and having the foresight to speak on this subject at this time mm -hmm. uh, in which, of course, America needs a lot of help. And let me welcome all of the mayors to our committee, Government Operations, although, again, I'm not a member of the subcommittee. Let me say that I work very closely with the chairman and the rest of the membership of this committee. Let me introduce to you one of the youngest mayors that Laredo has ever had, Laredo, Texas. Laredo, as some of you might know, and those of you that do not know, will now know, that it is one of the largest inland ports in the nation. So much traffic goes through there that sometimes it takes a couple of days to, for trucks to come from Nuevo Laredo, or the Mexican side, to the side of Laredo on the U.S. side. So, uh, Mayor Saul Ramirez, in the short time that he has been involved as a mayor, has done a tremendous job for us in representing our area. But before that, he was one of our city council persons there in Laredo, always involved in community work, in state work, and of course, in national involvement. Those were some of his traits. As I said, he's one of our youngest, or the youngest mayor that Laredo has ever had, a well-prepared young man. But he's also struggling, like a lot of mayors, just to put together a working program in Laredo. Laredo suffers from infrastructure just like many other cities, especially in an area in which we get billions of dollars from the tariffs there at the border, from crossings at the border, but the United States government takes it all in, the Treasury takes it all in, and they don't share with our city there. So we have a population of about 140,000 people with an infrastructure for about 100,000 people. So we welcome this hearing, Mr. Chairman, when it comes to revenue sharing. I used to be a county commissioner and a county judge in Texas and was one of those that during my time as county commissioner and county judge received revenue sharing and we used that for infrastructure, for capital, expenditures and for hiring people in many areas. So we think that that this program that you've advocated is a good program and that people such as you have here today are here to tell us that these programs will work and that they need the help. So it is really a pleasure for me to welcome my friend, my mayor, Saul Ramirez from Laredo, Texas. Thank you, Mr. Bustamante. We, we note that uh, Jack Hebner, who we had given up at the airport, uh, finally made it in, and we're, we're very happy here because he rep represents the National League of Cities. I'm going to ask uh, Jack Norquist, 
uh, with prayers for Jerry Kleska to begin our comments here, and then followed by Commissioner Eady, uh, Charles Box, and uh, then Jack Hebner uh, to be lead off. We, we, we know that you won't repeat anything that's already been said so that you can get to the core of your remarks, and we appreciate your patience. Thank you. I'll try to keep my remarks as short as the introductions. The, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Mayor John Norquist of the City of Milwaukee, a city of 628,000 people. It's represented by, uh, very ably by uh, Congressman Jerry Kletchka and Congressman Jim Moody. And uh, I'm here today to speak in support of the bill that you have introduced, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. As we meet, the eyes and ears of the world are on Madrid. The Middle East will be on prime time. Ted Koppel and Nightline will compete with Johnny Carson. And meanwhile, this nation's domestic agenda is given a time slot reserved for the late, late, late show, something to fill in between Vegematic commercials and the ads for 900 numbers. And no one in this room would discount the importance of the Madrid peace talks the President deserves high praise for his vigorous mediation efforts. However, the fact is, when it comes to the home front, President Bush has been a couch potato. In charge of the nation's remote control, he pushes the mute button every time a domestic problem appears on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Today, my city, like others, is hard-pressed to provide vital services to the elderly, the poor, the homeless, the unemployed. As mayor, I've held spending well under the rate of inflation, under 3 percent for the last four years. That's lower than state government, the federal government, or any other level of government. At the same time, we've increased the number of police by 159. And this year, we have a 16 percent increase in the police budget while holding the overall budget below 3 percent. Make no mistake, I've taken these steps because it's the right thing to do. The elected leaders of other American cities can point to similar efforts to bolster, lo bolster local economies by cutting costs. And I want to stress this point because skeptics often charge that new revenues directed to cities would be used to pad wasteful budgets. This is not the case. Local government spends more frugally than any other level of government in America. In January of this year, the United States Conference of Mayors released the results of its 50-city survey, which uh, we have copies available for the members. 58 percent of the city respondents reported budget shortfalls in fiscal 91. And to deal with these shortfalls, 42 percent of the cities had to both raise taxes and cut services. For those mayors who are raising taxes and cutting services in order to meet the increasing demands of mandates and social problems, the Tip O'Neill axiom that all politics is local is becoming all too real. Mr. Chairman, the people of America's cities pay a great deal, a great amount in federal taxes and get very little back. Cities could use the new revenue in this bill merely just to pay for the mandates under the uh, EPA stormwater discharge permitting program. In Milwaukee, we're not the sole cause of runoff pollution, but because we're the biggest city in the river shed, we pay and others don't. Other countries around the world understand that cities are the engines that drive the economy, that provide jobs, that are the base of the culture and vitality of the people. Just imagine how Japan looks at Tokyo. They don't feel sorry for it. They don't have pity. They don't look at it as an obsolete place. They invest billions of dollars in the infrastructure of Tokyo because they know it creates wealth. And the same thing is true of Paris and France or of uh, Frankfurt and Germany. They invest dollars there because that's what makes those countries rich and richer than our country, getting richer. In fact, even in Canada, look at Toronto and Montreal. Nobody in Canada feels sorry for Toronto and Montreal, but the federal government of Canada has, has cared for the, and invested in the infrastructure of their cities. 
Not long ago, just last week, we heard about Taiwan embarking on a $300 billion six-year public works program with railroads, transit, bridges, and other infrastructure to make Taiwan grow economically. This investment will make Taiwan even richer. And Mr. Chairman, is this country, this government going to let Taiwan pass us up? When are we going to fully understand that today's investment in our country is tomorrow's prosperity? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Congressman Conyers, there's a lot of ways that the federal government can invest in cities. This bill is one of them. And we're not here begging for help. We're not here with a tin cup in our hand. What we're asking the federal government to do is care about America's cities as much as they do about other places in the world. That's all. We can and we must start to invest in our own country. You collect a lot of taxes from the cities that are represented here today. And it's time that the federal government invest in our own cities, in our own country. This bill is an opportunity to do that, and I ask you not to let it slip away. Thank you very much. Hang on just a minute. Uh, let's uh, hear now from uh, Commissioner Eady, and uh, we thank you uh, very much, Jack, for uh, John. Uh, uh, John, for for laying this on us uh, in the in the effective way that you we knew you would as a representative of the U.S. Conference of Mayors and National League of Cities. Miss Eady, welcome to the hearings. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello. My name is Marlene Eady, and I'm a county commissioner in Williams County, North Dakota. I am testifying on behalf of the National Association of Counties, NACO, and I also serve as chair of NACO's Transportation Policy Steering Committee. Chairman Conyers, we want to congratulate and applaud you for introducing Local Partnership Act and holding these hearings today. I have testimony prepared that I'd, I'd like to enter, but mostly I'd like to visit with you about Williams County, North Dakota. Um, Williams County is in the northwest corner of the state of North Dakota. It's um, the area I know best, though I think what's happening there is fairly representative of rural counties across the nation. Our economy is based on grains, mostly wheat, and then along the Missouri River we have some large cattle ranches. Um, we also had, for a while, a very prosperous oil boom that has now gone bust. Last week, the citizens of one of the towns in my county came and asked that their town be dissolved. There are only 11 people left in that town, and they're all over age 65. They could no longer maintain a town government. This is not unusual. Uh, it's the first one that's come to the county commission, but it's going to be happening again and again. <clears throat> I prepare a number of income tax returns each year for, for people in, in uh, my town, and I'm appalled at the number of these people who no longer carry any type of health insurance. These are not people who don't care. They simply have to make a choice of whether to have insurance or food on the table. When the oil boom went bust in, in 1982 in my county, it went bust in about two months. At the time, of, in early 1982, we had about 37,000 people in my county. We now have about 28,000. We had um, booming businesses. Um, we had people who were building. For instance, since 1986, in the city of Williston, which is the largest city in the county, about half the population, they have issued 13 building permits since 1986. In 1982, they issued 303. So there is no construction business left. Uh, when the people left following the, the bust, they walked away from their homes. They, the homes, they couldn't get the price out of them to sell them. There was nobody to buy them. Um, they simply, they were a detriment, so they walked away. 
while the boom was going, the city of Williston and to some degree the county had um, set up special assessment districts to pay for improvements. The city of Williston was left burdened with something in the neighborhood of $16 million in special assessments from people who walked away from their homes. North Dakota has a, a delinquent tax procedure whereby when taxes are not paid for five years, the county takes the property. We are taking a massive amount of property for unpaid taxes. The county is now getting to be one of the largest landowners in the county. Uh, this does not generate revenue. Uh, Williams County also has about 46,000 acres of federal land and 38,000 acres of land owned by the state. Um, the North Dakota legislature over the years has passed a number of lead bills uh, providing privileged exemptions. With the privileged and the absolute exemptions, about 14% of the property in the county is exempt. Um, with the, with the houses that I told you people let go back, the valuation has gone down. The only thing we do is raise taxes on who's left. <laughs> there isn't a whole lot. Um, also, the weather doesn't help. It was 21 degrees below zero when I left there at noon yesterday. Hmm. <clears throat> um, we, had, we try very hard to assess or value property equally. But we were further faced with a problem when HUD did what we call the HUD dump. HUD took out ads in the paper to sell property that they had taken back. Now these were homes that were on the assessment rolls for $42,000 down to maybe $35,000. HUD dumped them at $8,000 or less. Now when you've bought a house for $8,000 or $6,000 and you get a property tax bill where it's valued at $15,000, you're angry. But if we reduce the value on all similar property to make it equal, then we would have had virtually destroyed our tax base. So the HUD dump was another problem. Um, if we had additional funds, it would be my priority that we would fund things like home health care, which is a discretionary program. When you have to cut, you cut discretionary programs to fund mandated programs. And home health care is a program where it saves the taxpayer money and allows people the dignity of staying in their homes. We also have problems, for instance, buying equipment. It's said around our country that our equipment is older than the operators. Uh, we had not too long ago where a, a defective clutch on a paving machine that was, or on a uh, roller, it was a 24-year-old roller. The clutch let go, ran over a young man that was working nearby. Um, the county was sued. The manufacturer of the equipment was sued. It was built 24 years ago. You know, how could it be expected to meet today's design criteria? And where are we going to get the money to buy something new? We don't have it. The budget in Williams County has, has increased slightly over the last few years. Our total budget now is in the neighborhood of $6.5 million. We, have a, we had during the boom about 170 county employees. Now there are less than 120 county employees. No county employee has received a raise in over four years except for this year. We're going to give them $35 a month. $35 a month. It isn't much, but it shows the commissioners are, are uh, sympathetic with their needs and are trying to provide for them. And by the way, the county commissioner's salary has remained the same for eight years. We've had such a decrease in federal and state funding. For instance, in social services. In 1984, our total budget was 876000 The local share was less than half of that. In 1990, Mostly due to federal mandates, our budget is $1.4 million. The local share is about two-thirds of that. So we have to, to raise additional money for unfunded mandates. There are things like the Americans with Disabilities Act. We put a new door in the courthouse, $47,000. We need to put in new bathrooms. We don't have $50,000 to remove the asbestos. Um, and this story goes on. 
I'd also like to bring to your attention a survey which uh, NACO did uh, on budget problems being faced by the four, over 400 of the largest counties. And I would like also to leave that with you. Could we ask that you uh, begin to work toward a summary, ma'am? <laughs> I will quit. <laughs> um, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. And if there are any questions, I would be pleased to answer them. Thank you. Well, we appreciate uh, the, the very uh, harrowing description that you've uh, brought here to the table. And I, I think that there will be some questions after it. Uh, I'd like now to uh, ask, uh, representing the U.S. Conference of Mayors, Mayor Charles Box of Rockford, Illinois, to make his presentation at this time, please. Good morning. Chairman Conyers and other distinguished members of the House of Representatives Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations Subcommittee of the Committee on Government Affairs. My name is Charles Box, I'm Mayor of the City of Rockford. Uh, my congressman is Mr. Cox, and we're sometimes confused because of the name, uh, Cox and Box, but we managed to get along. <laughs> I'm mayor of the city of Rockford, uh, as he, Congressman indicated, we're the second largest city in the state of Illinois. And I'm here to testify on the need for passage of the Fiscal Partnership with Local Governments Act of 1991. Rockford is a city of 140,000 residents, approximately 90 miles northwest of the city of Chicago. In February of 1982, Rockford had the dubious distinction of having 25% of its workforce unemployed. By May of 1983, the city, as an employer, had been forced to cut its own workforce by approximately 10% to help us balance our budget as required by law. Although by September of 1988, Rockford had recovered enough to enjoy a 94.5% employment rate or 5.5% unemployment rate, the city workforce remains to this day at a bare bones level. Increased cost of doing business, Reductions in federal funds and federal and state mandates have forced the city to maintain the same workforce while experiencing increases in the demand for services annually. My department heads are just now in the process of preparing the FY92 budgets. It's not a pretty picture. To maintain the current level of services already lower in many areas than other citizens should expect and to allow for only a small increase in salaries, the city will be at a maximum corporate levy permitted by the state. If we are to balance our budget in this and coming years, we will have to consider such options as reducing police services when we need to add to them, snow plowing only arterial and collective streets, and some are less than safe and helpful choices. We will not even be able to consider adding a necessary fourth ambulance, thereby raising medical response time to levels that are unacceptable and unsafe. And Rockford is one of the more fortunate cities in the country. We are just now beginning to experience the recession that has devastated much of the rest of the country. Just last week, I received two official notifications of plant closings. These two alone affect over 250 workers. In the past three months, announced layoffs have equaled almost 2% of the regional workforce. I hesitate to open my mail these days. Our elastic sales tax revenues are stretched to their limit. Our sales tax revenues are not 4% higher than last year, as expected because of recent annexation activity, but they're lower than last year's. To you, being 700,000 lower than budget estimate is not terribly earth-shattering. To us, it represents that fourth ambulance, as I previously mentioned, or being able to add one or two more foot patrols that could definitely be a deterrent to crime. Even in a small, conservative Midwestern city like Rockford, increases in armed robberies, drive-by shootings, drug-related deaths, and aggravated assaults are, strength, are stretching our police department beyond human endurance. Right now, we are considering re removing essential services like traffic enforcement and traffic accidents from the responsibility of sworn officers just to stay even with the increase in violent crime. Zoning, building, and property standard codes are going unenforced because we cannot afford to hire enough inspectors. How can I enforce zoning codes with three technicians who can only devote one-third of their time to enforcement because of other necessary duties in a city of 45 square miles? I have focused thus far only on day-to-day -day operations of the city of Rockford. I have not begun to address our capital needs. Like most communities of this country, we stress the life cycle of our streets, our water and sewer facilities, our public buildings, our bridges, our fire trucks, and our transit vehicles, far beyond prudent property management standards. Rockford struggles to maintain an annual capital improvements budget of $20 million. It should be a substantial multiple of that. What did it take, or what did it mean when Rockford lost revenue sharing funds after 1986? We receive approximately 2.3 million annually. Most of 
those funds over the 15 years of the program were used for basic police, public works, and public transit operations. Today, I would probably use those funds to provide police foot patrols in at least two neighborhoods in our city that are infested with crime, dealing, and drugs. Foot patrols have proven effective in neighborhoods throughout the country. Some of the remainder of the funds I would use to begin to pay the bill Congress presented to the city in 1987 when they passed the Clean Water Act, source identification and preparation of a plan to control and treat stormwater discharge. That mandated cost alone has, a, has the potential of, of absorbing a serious portion of any revenue shared with the City of Rockford as well as that with any other communities under the Local Partnership Act of 1991. I have spoken primarily to the question of the need for shared federal revenue shares with the city I govern. It is a story no different from the 39,000 other local governments affected by this legislation. Let me address this particular legislation by focusing on what I believe are its major strengths. One, the formula targets the funds to the local governments that are the most needy. It does this by including in the formula both the per capita income of the residents of locality as well as the unemployment rate for the state in which the locality is located. Two, the legislation allows local governments the ability to spend the money to meet its greatest needs and highest priorities. This flexibility recognizes the great diversity of local governments in this country. It also acknowledges that the government closest to the people will be the most responsive in solving local problems. And three, the legislation is designed to simplify management of the funds so that they can be integrated into financial systems already in place at the local level and not create unnecessary and new administrative costs. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to testify, uh, and also I'd be pleased to respond to any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you, uh, Mayor Box. We appreciate your testimony very much. Uh, I'd like now to call uh, the representative of the National League of Cities from Spokane, Washington, uh, Councilman Jack Hebner. Members of the committee, thank you very much. My name is Jack Hebner. I am a council member from the city of Spokane, Washington. I also have the privilege of serving on the National League of, uh, National League of Cities Board of Directors. Furthermore, I do have a letter here from the Seattle City Council signed by Mayor Rice and all of the members of that council further supporting the fiscal partnership that we are discussing today, and I would hope that that would be entered into the record. We would be you happy to accept that into the record. Thank you. As you listen to all of us here today at this particular table, I think that you're beginning to see that there is a very strong picture that we're trying to paint. And I know that I could go through my prepared remarks and they would probably not differ from some of the others that you have heard. What I would like to do in my very brief amount of time that I have here this morning is to share with you a frustration. I was first elected in 1981. And in 1981, there was a partnership that existed between the federal government and with cities and towns across this country. Somewhere during the last decade, that partnership has gone away. And suddenly, all of us elected officials who get votes from the very same people that you get votes from, people who vote for our congressman, who vote for Tom Foley, vote for me. And suddenly, we have become a special interest group and we are fighting for dollars just like people in other parts of the world. I believe that that frustration is beginning to surface all across this country. All of us have a responsibility to the people who elected us to provide them with the infrastructure they need, with the dollars to maintain a livable standard in the cities and towns in which they live, and to provide them with the things that we all want to provide them with such as quality education, clean water, clean air, all of those things. And so we look at this particular piece of legislation as a very important, a very critical first step in terms of reordering America's priorities. I had the opportunity and the privilege to work over the last two years with the National League of Cities Subcommittee, and we don't believe anymore that the threats to the American society and our way of life clearly come from the Soviet Union. We believe that the threats to what it is that we cherish really comes from economic forces in other countries. We clearly believe that when you look at Europe currently devoting a far greater proportion of its resources to investment in economic productivity, when you look, look at Japan investing nearly 10 times the amount that we do in terms of public infrastructure, that's 
the key point. That's the threat to our American way of life and the kinds of things that we could ultimately lose as the years go by and the next decade moves into a new century. I am sure that as I look around this very distinguished group of individuals, or if I were to go to the House or the Senate in total, many people would say that there is no revenue to share, that the authorization level of this particular bill is far beyond what we can afford. I would say that that is wrong. The amount proposed here is less than one quarter of the amount currently pending in the House alone for this year's SNL bailout. Currently, it represents about a third of what is proposed in terms of tax cuts from both Republicans and Democrats in either the House or the Senate. Now, I happened to read a newspaper article this morning that said that last year's deficit was $258 billion. It seems to me if you're going to reduce taxes, that only makes the deficit worse. And so it would seem to me that there needs to be a program to reprioritize what it is that we're doing. Furthermore, this particular bill and the bill we believe is a good bill because it does not hide the fact that you're going to be spending money. It does not take money off budget. It is not something that breaks the budget agreement rules. In fact, Mr. In fact, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, there is money there. Last year, the very committee that I helped work with, the one that I, I chaired two years ago and had an opportunity to continue with last year, said that what we really ought to do in a vote of our board of directors, Republicans, Independents, Democrats, they said that what we really ought to be doing is reducing the defense budget by nearly 33 percent and going from $300 billion down to $200 billion in just a mere five-year period. And then what we said was, we don't want all of that money. What we would like to do is take 60 percent of those savings and put that money back into deficit reduction but 40% of the money needs to be put into reprioritizing what it is that we do in America. We need to invest in economic conversion and in economic adjustment. I think when you look at the past 10 years, it comes as no surprise that we've seen a decline in real wages by most Americans. Our infrastructure is in fact crumbling. Our education system compares poorly on any international measure. You see, after a decade of disinvestment in cities and towns, a majority of cities are being forced to cut back on vital services and public infrastructure. That message will be made over and over and over again. As I look at what I must see in my city, I see infant mortality rates, I see poverty, I see unemployment, and yes, even violent crimes in eastern Washington and Spokane, Washington. However, I also see a Congress that forgives debts, that uses taxpayer-assisted bailouts, and finally sends financial assistance dollars overseas. And then that same Congress treats its people, who happen to live in cities and towns across this country, in a much harsher method than people elsewhere around the world are actually treated. <coughs> Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Chelsea, Massachusetts are not exceptions to the rule. They really typify the results of disinvestment. In short, what we've really seen is we've seen federal mandates. And we've tried to comply. We've raised taxes. We're paying bills for your priorities, but we're no longer a partner. I'd merely like to leave you with one thought that I think is very important and it really sums up the frustration that I feel and many of the representatives in Eastern Washington happen to feel and just plain citizens really believe. President Bush goes on TV and he talks about a new world order. But in our country, we have an old world order. We cannot afford to avoid challenges to our economic leadership in this world. We believe a program designed to allow the federal government to once again work with cities to bring the nation together must be the foundation for any new domestic order. That's the very foundation and we would like to be a part. This bill, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, would make a very important start. It's a very valuable first step. We offer our support, we offer our help, and we urge you to support the bill. Thank you very much and I'd be very happy to answer questions when we're all done. Well, your statement was very important and very moving. 
Would it, would it embarrass you to reveal that you are a Republican councilman? <laughs> it would not embarrass me. This is bipartisan me. support that we're, we're building up. And it would occur to me that the only way that we are going to really reprioritize is to have that bipartisan support. We had to do that in the National League of Cities. We had to do that with big cities, small cities, medium size. Those, run, those cities run by Democrats, by Republicans. And where we are is we need to work together. With well, the help. only thing Craig Thomas wants to know up here is uh, where are we going to get the bread? And, and we've got to explain that to him to his satisfaction. And we'll begin to build up uh, bipartisanship on, on this side of the uh, counter as well. Mr. I, I Chairman, thought, let me observe. There's one Republican in this panel. That shows kind of the division we have here. Interesting, but I'm delighted you're here, sir. Well, there's only one Republican on this panel on this side, so <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if it's interesting, I did not let them vote if I could come with them today. If that's right. <laughs> uh, we're going to uh, ask your indulgence, uh, leaders at the local level. Uh, I have promised uh, the President of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Mr. Gerald McEntee, that I'd allow him on for a, a brief presentation. And with your indulgence, uh, Jerry, I'd like you to come forward uh, right now. Maybe you could squeeze in a chair in between uh, Box and Norquist. And uh, we, we'll, we'll work this uh, in. We know you're a man of a uh, few words and, <laughs> and, uh, and are able to summarize uh, 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 very briefly and succinctly. So we're very happy to welcome you at this point of the proceedings. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity and showing uh, myself and our union the people we represent the consideration in terms of uh, your timely schedule and problems uh, and hours. Uh, it's nice to sit on this side of a table uh, with the mayors. I'm usually on the other side of the table uh, with the mayors, so this is indeed a real treat uh, this morning. Uh, you said that uh, I have a reputation for being brief, uh, which is uh, uh, a little inaccurate, but I'm going to be brief. Uh, I, do, uh, I do have a statement for the record, and our staff had prepared a, a statement as well uh, that uh, they wanted me to read, but I'm not going to read it. I just, uh, I just want to mention uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the hearings and uh, the other members uh, of the committee. Uh, I really would like to talk about uh, the city of uh, Bridgeport. Uh, Congresswoman DeLora knows about that. I'd like to mention, I, I heard Tommy Foglietta uh, this morning. Uh, he comes from the city of Philadelphia. And then I'd like to, to talk a little bit about New York City. Uh, I think that we probably all know uh, some of the reasons for the problems of the cities today. We know about health care costs, uh, the escalation, uncontrollable. We know about Medicaid. Uh, we know about uh, court mandates and prison population and the fact that not only states but uh, cities and counties have to build uh, more prisons uh, by virtue of court mandates and that uh, we're even in a situation in many places today where we're du double bunking uh, where we have inmates, uh, two, sometimes three, in one particular cell, and uh, we have a prison population burgeoning and a system ready to, uh, to explode. Uh, I marched in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut uh, this summer uh, because of the conditions in that city. Uh, we represent uh, the people who work uh, in Bridgeport. Uh, a year and a half ago, they went back to the collective bargaining table and uh, they granted through the collective bargaining procedure, and I say granted, um, uh, give backs that would total $4,000, not only in wage increases, uh, but in vacation and in holidays. And uh, in addition to that, 
Uh, they're basically uh, blue collar workers. Uh, they are basically workers, uh, people of color, uh, that don't have a lot of money, uh, that live in the city of uh, Bridgeport, uh, incidentally in a county that, uh, as the Congresswoman knows, is the highest per capita income county uh, in the United States. And our people came forward and gave back uh, a total of $4,000 in wages and benefits, and it didn't save the city. Uh, as a matter of fact, this summer, uh, according to the mayor at that particular time, the city went belly up and bankrupt, and she filed bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, we were eventually able to, uh, to win that in the court, and it has not been decided as of yet that the city is bankrupt, but it is on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, the libraries, uh, most of them closed, the swimming pools for the kids, uh, open uh, during the summer only a couple days a week and this is Bridgeport Connecticut in a uh, in a state uh, relatively per capita income wise once again a very wealthy state in a county that's very wealthy and here we have a city that uh, verges on bankruptcy and there is no other place to go for that city with the exception of the federal government our people can't give anymore. I mean, our people now that work for the city of Bridgeport, 50% of them are eligible to be on welfare as they work for the city of Bridgeport, still trying to provide services for people. And if a city like Bridgeport, and you can multiply it across the country, if they don't get help from the federal government, that city is gone. Now that's one example. The second example, as I said, Tom Foglietta was here uh, this morning, and he mentioned the city of Philadelphia. It was only seven months ago in the city of Philadelphia uh, when, as uh, they had to do in the past, they had to go in uh, to get uh, short-term notes to the tune of $250 million in order to carry them over, as many cities do, uh, for four or five months until their taxes start to roll in in the early spring. And uh, so the city went into the market and uh, tried to get the money. Uh, because of the condition of the city, uh, because of statements uh, by virtue of the finance director and the city uh, controller, they were met uh, in the bond market, they were met in the banks with a jaundiced eye and they couldn't come up with $250 million in short-term notes to carry them over. And once again, we represent the blue-collar, white-collar workers to the tune of 13,000, 14,000 people in the city of Philadelphia. Two years ago, went to the collective bargaining table, saw fit to reduce the holiday package, the vacation package, and took a very, very minimum contract not even meeting the rate of inflation that year and the next year as well. Our people recognize the problem. Our people work in these cities day in and day out. They saw fit to come forward and try and help their city. This was two years before. It did not provide the solution to the city of Philadelphia. And as a result, as I said, went into the market. And they couldn't get the money in the market. Uh, we then, uh, through the city pension system, where we have representatives, saw fit to buy some of these bonds, and the pension system had to come forward before the banks would even consider buying some bonds from the city of Philadelphia. But then the banks did come forward. These are banks located in the city of Philadelphia, and they charge the city of Philadelphia 28% interest in order to buy those bonds and buy those notes. 28% banks located right inside the city of Philadelphia. This is when the federal government is preparing to give farm loans to the Soviet Union, guaranteeing 98% of the loans, guaranteeing 4% of the payment of the loans, and here are banks within the confines of a city charging 27, 28% interest to that particular city, even putting them in terms of a short-term solution, helping them out, in terms of a long-term solution, even putting them deeper into trouble. That's the city of Philadelphia. And that is not the exception either. 
across the United States. And you can, you can multiply this in Nassau County, Suffolk County, Albany, Milwaukee, I mean, all these kinds of places. The other one I would just like to mention is uh, a story I read in the New York Times just about three weeks ago. A matter of fact, it was two stories, different parts of the New York Times. One was about, a, well, there were about two cities. And the first city was a city now where the water that comes out of the faucets is beautiful and clean and drinkable, uh, where the roads are uh, being completed in terms of uh, repair, where the food markets are stocked with uh, Perrier water and fresh cuts of meat, and uh, they're selling them and people are buying them. Uh, in the uh, automotive showrooms, they're filled with Mercedes and Porsche and Chryslers, and the people are buying them. And as a matter of fact, every person, every adult in that city, in terms of reparations, is going to get $75,000 from their government. And that was the story of one city. Then there was a the story of another city, where the water isn't always clean that comes out of the faucets, where 65% of the streets and gutters need repair desperately where the bridges are crumbling and falling apart, the telephones don't always work, the swimming pools for poor kids over the summer open two days a week, and now libraries sometimes open a day a week. And rarely do the majority of the citizens in this city drink Perrier water, and they certainly don't drive Chryslers and Mercedes. And they're not getting any reparations at all. And one city was Kuwait. And the other city was New York City. And I guess the message that I have for the members of the Congress of the United States, and it's short and succinct, uh, is this. And it's also doubly important that the administration hear it as well. And I heard the question just mentioned a few moments ago, where do we get the money? Well, we get the money in places like that. All right, we take the caps off the budget agreement that were put in about two years ago. We don't have a Warsaw Pact anymore. We don't have to give money to Western Europe anymore. We don't have to give $80 billion to Norway anymore. We don't have those kinds of problems anymore. We don't need a defense budget the size that we have now. We don't have those kinds of problems anymore. And the question of where we get the money, if we could get some kind of money off budget, for Kuwait, by God, we better get it for the cities in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McEntee. You, you didn't disappoint us with a very important message. Your, your brevity will still be debated in this <laughs> hall long after you're gone. I'd like to recognize Ted Weiss, the subcommittee chairman, briefly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to welcome Mr. McEntee to uh, these hearings. He has been a long time uh, fighter in the effort to have our states and localities be able to provide our fellow citizens, our constituents, if you will, uh, with uh, the possibility of dignified uh, qualities of, of life back home. One of the things that I, I don't think that you mentioned, but I think we all ought to be aware of, sometimes there's a tendency to, for the, for the broad world out there, to think of uh, the people who provide services for us, the people whom you represent in your organization, uh, as being just pegs in, in, in holes and who are able to be moved around and that, who don't have any feelings or lives of their own and they don't have, aren't, aren't subject to normal amounts of stress. When the cities that you mentioned go through the kind of trauma that they're going through, it's not just their uh, fellow citizens who suffer, they suffer inordinately because they're asked to assume burdens far beyond that which they were hired to do to begin with. And so uh, I know that you have special reason and special concern about all of our citizens, but also the people whom you represent, who are being asked really to assume the burdens that all of society ought to be assuming, and the federal government I think it's high time got back into the game and started providing some of the, the resources to deal with these problems. Again, thank you very much for your work and your efforts.
Mr. President, we uh, will be thinking about your remarks. We, there may be some questions submitted to you that I know you will uh, send us an answer back for the record. And we'd uh, like you to stay as long as you can. But I'd like to now recognize Gerald Borovic. Thank you. Of Monroe Township, Pennsylvania. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be appear before you today. I am Jerry Borovic, Chairman of the Board of Supervisors of Monroe Township in Clarion County, Pennsylvania. I'm also a board member of the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors. I would like to say right off, speaking for myself and my two Republican colleagues on the Township Board of Supervisors, that we support the Local Partnership Act. I should also say that our state association adopted a bipartisan resolution in 1987, which is still policy, urging the reinstatement of the Federal General Revenue Sharing Program. Monroe Township is located in western Pennsylvania and has a population of around 1,300. Clarion County has a population of 42,000 and is very rural. This area of Pennsylvania is characterized by a declining population, a slipping tax base, and little, if any, economic growth. Industry is not moving into my community. The general economic decline in, of western Pennsylvania is compounded by the recession. Monroe Township isn't like some of the communities you are hearing from today. In fact, we are getting our first traffic signal when the federal highway funds start flowing again, where a state highway crosses one of our local roads. We have an annual budget of about $250,000. The township has four employees, three of whom are full-time. They provide general road maintenance. One of our supervisors is one of those full-time employees. That is the extent of our workforce. We used to have a number of volunteers who donated their time to the township, but we have had to discontinue using volunteers for liability reasons. We currently receive no money from the federal government. During the height of general revenue sharing, we received approximately $10,000. With an evaluation back then of $5 million, that was good for two of the mills that we were allowed by the state to assess on property taxes. When the, when the program ended in 1986, our community had a budget of around $225,000, including about eight to $9,000 in general revenue sharing. It was with the help of general revenue sharing funds that we were able to build our current township building. Prior to that program, we had no office, which means that as a community, we had no real identity. There was no one defining symbol, such as a county courthouse, to give members of the township a sense of place. Now we have a single place where people can come to vote, get information on zoning and building permits, or attend the monthly township meetings. We're also able to purchase new equipment and replace antiquated equipment used to provide township services. We use the general revenue sharing money on capital expenditures so that we wouldn't have to depend on the federal government for future income. We did not even build capital facilities that would require major ongoing operation and maintenance. And we did not institute programs that would increase payroll costs because we did not feel confident enough that the funds would continue and then we would have to lay off employees. There are a number of things that we wish we could provide to our township residents that we are unable to right now. As I mentioned earlier, our annual budget is around 250000 Among the uses we have for that money is maintaining 52 miles of local roads, two-thirds which are gravel roads. These roads and bridges are critical to our local government and community. They're largely the only means of transportation in the township so we keep them in good shape so our residents can get to work, kids can get to school, and emergency vehicles can respond. We spend $200,000 annually, four-fifths of our budget, maintaining our local roads and bridges. That doesn't leave us much left over to get other things done. Since the mid-1980s, environmental issues have increasingly become a concern of our residents. They hear about problems with drinking water in other communities and naturally become wondering how safe and clean their own drinking water is. Most of the township's drinking water supply comes from private wells. We also have a large number of on-lot sewage systems, residents who are concerned about neighbors contaminating their drinking water supplies. 
We are the first place a resident comes for help when they want to know if their drinking water is safe. But we do not have the capabilities in-house to supply drinking water tests. We cannot afford to hire a service con to conduct testing either. The Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Resources is busy dealing with larger issues, such as strip mining and solid waste disposal. There is no one around to help the small communities. At this time, we have no environmental initiatives in our community. If we were to receive federal money again, we would definitely want to provide some environmental services to our residents. I'm thinking here of testing water or at least helping to pay for tests. We could have water tested for a new subdivision, for example. We would also like to test some of the streams in the township, especially those that are more popular with our children. To sum it up, Mr. Chairman, we are kind of treading, in, treading water in our township. We are not sinking yet, but I think we are a lot, a lot like other small rural communities that aren't moving ahead either. We can't provide some things, enough things to keep moving forward or to promise our kids a future worth staying for. As I've said, the economy of Western Pennsylvania is slow. There is not enough money to provide many of the things we should provide, and everything seems to cost more. For example, because of the mandates governing underground storage tanks, there are virtually no small service stations in the township. The mom and pop gas stations can't afford to stay in business anymore. That means that we have to go farther to get gas, and when we get there, we are charged more because those station owners have less competition. That costs township residents more and also costs the township more because we have to buy from them too. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my remarks, and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. Well, Mr. Borovic, you've drawn a, a very poignant and a clear picture for this committee. We appreciate your testimony. I'd like to now turn to the mayor of East Orange, New Jersey, uh, mayor Cardell Cooper. Good morning and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, to my congressman, the Honorable Donald Payne, a congressman that's been quite a few days in the 10th Congressional District and many days in my city, and to all the members of this committee. I'm indeed honored to be here this morning to, one, endorse the concept of this bill, and two, to share with my fellow mayors and other elected representatives uh, information with you that affects all of America's cities, uh, be they large or be they small. It's painful sometimes when you hear the story and quite often when you hear other people's troubles, it lightens your load a little bit, but it really doesn't shed any real hope, if you will. One of the concerns that we have in America today is how will we begin to work together again? I believe this bill addresses that. We're not pitting cities against hamlets. We're not taking small towns and large towns and having them compete against one another. We're not asking people who hold political office to make a decision based on geography. We're simply asking people to come together to do the right thing for America's cities and American hamlets and American villages and townships. The city of East Orange is 3.9 square miles with roughly 90,000 people living on 3.9 square miles. We're a relatively small city in size compared to other cities around us. Our next door neighbor, the great city of Newark, uh, is right next door to our borders. New York City is 12 miles from East Orange, and we're plagued with all of the fiscal calamities that have hit other urban centers throughout this country since the early 1980s. Local governments are faced with serious and threatening challenges that affect the economic and social fiber of our existence. Federal cutbacks and federal entrenchment in many states have significantly reduced the share of local revenues provided by the federal government and states. The escalating costs of federal and state mandated programs are placing growing fiscal burdens on all cities. Such national standards as it relates to the environment, although necessary, will create additional costs to local government. One simple example is that now when we talk about demolishing old buildings in our cities, we must now not only provide money Such national standards as it relates to the environment, although necessary, will create additional costs to local government. One simple example is that now when we talk about demolishing old buildings in our cities, we must now not only provide money for demolition, but we must provide money for asbestos removal. An exorbitant cost that, again, local governments cannot afford to bear. With more than 5.5 million people living in poverty in this country, this phenomenon is becoming more increasingly concentrated in our urban areas. The movement of higher income households from cities to suburbs have given government greater responsibility. In my own city, over 50% of the residents are or below the poverty level.
It is also a well-known fact that local governments with greater proportion of the disadvantage have greater need for municipal services. Just as devastating is the eroding tax base that currently exists in many cities. The current economic recession compounds the problems of local governments already attempting to cope with difficult and financial circumstances beyond our control. Our city alone, we have witnessed an alarming number of foreclosures and bankruptcies of residential and commercial properties. That threat is basically to the entire foundation of any community. We cannot get in the business of owning apartment buildings and office complexes which are empty. Yet and still, there is no assistance provided to local governments to help rescue them from this dangerous notion of property ownership. At the same time, the country was able to bail out the savings and loan industry without much debate and forethought. In most situations, we are barely maintaining the services that we were elected to provide to our people. It is most important that we understand, and it's plain and simple, we do not have enough tools or resources to do the job. It is for these reasons that I am in support of this Local Partnership Act of 1991. <coughs> By authorizing the necessary appropriations, local governments would begin receiving much needed relief. By including the per capita income of the residents of the municipality and the unemployment rate for the state, those municipalities like mine will benefit. However, I must point out, and I would like to say that the unemployment rate for our state and in other states may not truly reflect sometimes the overall unemployment rate in urban centers populated by African American people or Hispanics. It is also important that we recognize when we use those numbers that we pay special attention to those people who simply have given up on trying to find a job or even collect unemployment because they are the ones who are lost and have fallen away alongside the way rather and do not become part of America's horror stories of statistics. But urban centers usually have a higher unemployment rate as we know and in New Jersey in particular with our difficulties that we're facing right now the unemployment rate in cities are climbing every day. In cities such as East Orange, Newark and Jersey City we're faced face with unemployment statistics which are now in double digits. Our disparity between the tax rate and those who are able to pay is greater in urban areas than anywhere else. The taxation of most dwellers is high relative to the suburban counterparts, causing a plight that began over two decades ago. In New Jersey, where the property tax provides a major form of revenue for the local government, the increase of the foreclosures and bankruptcies that I mentioned previously have been due in part to the inability of people to pay their taxes. Abatements and payments in lieu of taxes are mechanisms that assist property owners and developers but do very little to provide resources for current municipal operations. I do agree in the long run that these tools can be used to promote development and can assist in some instances, but we need fiscal help now. We need assistance where local governments can attract new revenue sources without giving away the store. The formula that is provided in the Local Partnership Act of 1991 to assist those local governments by providing more funds to local governments with high tax rates is needed. The city of East Orange, the average homeowner, pays $4,100 per year in taxes. Mr. Chairman, it is impossible for us to understand how is it possible that we can continue to spend money on international affairs and yet forget there has to be a domestic agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here in support of this particular piece of legislation. I commend the committee and I say to all of the mayors and leaders in urban America and the small hamlets and villages, our job now is to make sure that message is heard throughout this country. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for an eloquent statement, Mayor Cooper. And your uh, remarks, I know you had more to make, will be uh, included, uh, your entire statement will be included in its entirety in the record, and so will uh, all of the other witnesses. We're, we're racing against a, uh, a, a vote on the floor, so I'd, I'd ask you to uh, keep that in mind as we move along. I'd like now to call on uh, the county manager of uh, Ashe County, North Carolina, Mr. Michael Dixon. Welcome to the proceedings, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, committee members, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to appear before this distinguished committee in support of House Resolution 3601, Fiscal Partnership with Local Government Act of 1991. My name is Michael Dixon, and I am the county manager of Ashe County, North Carolina, where I have been a lifelong resident. Ashe is a small rural community located in the far northwestern corner of the state in the Appalachian Mountains. Our county has a population of 22,200, according to the 1990 census. We've lost a little over 100 people since the 1980 census. Our major industries are furniture manufacturing and agriculture. Many of your Christmas trees may have been grown in Ashe County. 
I am here today as a representative of Ashe County urging your favorable consideration of this bill. I have also brought a letter from Mr. Bill Owens, President of the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners in support of H.R. 3601. I would appreciate the Association's letter being included as part of the official record. We'd be happy to include that letter in our, in our proceedings. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your efforts to address the fiscal crisis facing many of our local governments. Newspaper headlines have publicized the unpopular actions taken by our, our larger cities and counties to avoid budget shortfalls. These measures have included drastic reductions in public services, staff terminations and furloughs, delays in infrastructure repairs, and decreased support to public schools. Rural governments are facing the same physical constraints. In Ashe County, our 1991-92 budget did not allow for any increases over 1990-91. Our employees did not receive any cost of living or other salary adjustment, and we were forced to delay an emergency services 911 telephone system. Counties in North Carolina rely most heavily on property taxes to support public services. In North Carolina, property taxes comprise over 38 percent of all county revenues. As a result of the surge of property values during the 1980s real estate boom, Counties received growing property tax receipts to fund many of the new mandated services imposed by state and federal governments. Since that time, however, property values in North Carolina and elsewhere have stagnated or are falling. We can no longer count on that revenue growth to support intergovernmental mandates. Our county has a large number of elderly residents living on fixed incomes. They cannot withstand higher property taxes. Substantial tax increases may force many to give up their homes. Property taxes are seen by economists as being highly regressive, such that the poorer and middle class families must pay a higher portion of their income in property taxes than their more affluent neighbors. A description of H.R. 3601's intent stated that the federal government's support of local government has declined by 40 percent during the 1980s. Nationally, we are now seeing a decline in state support as well, as state governments grapple with their own budget emergencies. In North Carolina, the state withheld some of the revenues that it collects on behalf of its local governments during the past fiscal year. The New Year's budget has frozen these revenues at 1990-91 levels, and we are concerned that further reductions will be forthcoming if the economic climate worsens in North Carolina. Despite declining intergovernmental revenues, county governments must fund increasingly expensive programs which are organized, controlled, and mandated by, by the state and federal governments. We pay 50 percent of the non-federal share for AFDC and 15 percent of Medicaid cost. Social services mandates are but the tip of the iceberg. The cost of doing business in local governments are increasing rapidly due to new federal environmental regulations. For example, EPA's revisions to the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act now require that all landfills be lined with synthetic materials and be equipped with monitoring wells for groundwater contamination and methane gas detection. As we anticipate our new landfill will cost uh, an additional $1,397,000 over the next five years alone. Given the new and ongoing mandated requirements of local governments, H.R. 3601 is welcome relief. Bill sponsors are to be commended for recognizing the impending federal crisis faced by local governments. In closing, we in North Carolina believe that additional federal funding allocations to local governments are essential to avert serious fiscal difficulties in the near term. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Fiscal Partnership with Local Governments Act. I'm hopeful that you will give favorable consideration to this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, we hope you have a successful Christmas tree season that, that will be coming up very shortly for your county. That's pretty important. We do too, sir. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Henry Hayes, Mayor, Little Rock, North Little Rock. Mr. Chairman, uh, it certainly is a pleasure to be before this committee and, and I can tell you that in sitting and listening to the members uh, up uh, behind the, the podium or up behind the, the desk uh, in front of you and, and certainly in listening to my colleagues uh, on, on this level, 
uh, the, the goosebumps have gone up and down my spine a number of times because we are indeed, in most instances, singing from the same choir book. Uh, I serve as a mayor of a city of 61,700. Uh, it's the largest city in Arkansas, as Congressman Thornton uh, indicated, to operate under a mayor for a council form of government. I not only have the opportunity to uh, to uh, uh, issue the proclamations and to cut the ribbons, but I also decide where the potholes are filled and uh, and where the uh, drainage ditches are are dug and and maintained. Now, I've had the opportunity over the years to serve in several different levels of government. I uh, in my college age uh, worked for Senator McClellan on the other side. Uh, of the Hill and spent three years off and on in service to him in addition to working for uh, a group that uh, that gave a great deal of support and assistance to local communities in LEAA which was uh, a uh, uh, so to speak a, a creation that uh, I know Senator McClellan fostered. Uh, for several years I had the opportunity to serve in the Arkansas legislature in addition to serving in a constitutional convention uh, that uh, was directed by our citizens and unfortunately they didn't adopt it but that experience was indeed uh, certainly satisfying and educational. Finally uh, I end up at what some refer to as the bottom of the rung uh, although I refer to it as the top of the heap when it comes to the different branches of government and, and what I have learned in the experiences that I've had in all three levels of government uh, is that in, indeed we all are a partnership and that's why the word that you have contained in your bill is so satisfying to me, partnership. Because indeed, if this country is going to uh, both regain and maintain its level of enthusiasm and indeed what it really is trying to do, Mr. Chairman, and that's maintain and improve the quality of life of our citizens. It saddens me to note that for the first time in the history of this country, uh, surveys are starting to reflect where people feel that our children will not be as well off as we are. And that just sort of goes right to the quick of, of what I believe that we are trying to do on the local level. Uh, I recall sitting during the Persian Gulf War and, and, and as, as patriotic a moment I think that I had an opportunity to feel time after time again when our men and our women were doing this country proud. But then I had thoughts that sort of crossed my mind when, uh, when one of the national announcers would say, there goes another Tomahawk missile. Uh, and I probably, Mr. Chairman, would be blasphemed for this statement. But when they told me that that Tomahawk missile cost $4 million, I'd have to say that if I was asked the question now, would I be able to use that $4 million to improve the quality of life for years to come for my citizens? or that that missile would indeed blow Saddam to smithereens, I probably would have to take that four million dollars. Let me give you an analogy, and I, I'm going <coughs> to defer to my colleague to the right. Uh, I don't want to go over my prepared text, and I'd hope that that would be included in the record, but I'd like to focus on attitude. Uh, the attitude of what I think the 80s gave to those of us in local government. In that attitude, I'll use the analogy of a foxhole. And we are indeed the foot soldiers in that foxhole. And we don't even know who the generals are. We have never even seen them. The majors and the colonels, they float around somewhere totally out of our sight and out of our realm of, of, of knowledge whatsoever. Uh, every once in a while we may get some directive with their name on it. Uh, we see maybe a lieutenant and he has yellow on his shoulder because he's a second lieutenant, if we see anybody of authority at all. And what we've been getting, or at least from an attitude perspective, what we've been receiving from the federal government, and we are sitting down in our foxhole and we'll say that we get a brand new rifle. And with that brand new rifle, we get a sheet of instructions. And that sheet of instructions says, unless you shoot it in this way, unless you aim it in this direction, unless you cradle it in this perspective manner, that we're going to have to charge you for that rifle because we are the ones that feel you know, we know how to tell you to use it the best. And then they finally say, oh, and by the way, we don't have to send, or we can't send you any ammunition right now. We're going to go ahead and li give you a list of local contractors or contractors that you can go buy that ammunition for. Are from. And so what do I do after looking at this? I take that rifle and I throw it away and I take the old piece of equipment that I have that I at least know a little bit about how to use it and go about my business. 
What this legislation does, Mr. Chairman, to us, uh, this legislation says that the general is now going to try to sit in the foxhole next to us, that the general is truly going to try to be a partnership uh, in, in the fight that we're having, having to make, and that truly this Congress and this nation is now going to do what it needs to do in order to ensure that the foundation of what we are trying to do on an international basis, and I can't tell you anymore how, how much pride that I have in the future of what I think this country can do. But Mr. Chairman, we have to look at home, and we have to realize that the foundation is cracked, uh, the giant is no longer sleeping, he's shouting very loudly, and he is hopefully through us shouting to this body and through this committee that action needs to be taken, that we are indeed drowning in our problems, and that we indeed need to have partners in trying to solve those problems and that that partnership needs to begin not only at the state level and the local level, but indeed at the federal level, which it is for so long sort of left us in a lurch. I kind of feel like, and I'll summarize my, summarize, summarize my testimony by saying, for a long time I felt kind of like Rocky in the 14th round. I keep getting spun around by Apollo Cree in Rocky I, but somehow I land on my feet Every once in a while, I have to pick myself up from the canvas. But indeed, Mr. Chairman, uh, I am going to survive. But I can't tell you how I ache and how much I want to survive to make sure that when those surveys start coming in and the year 2000 faces us, that we feel our children will yet again be better off than we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Hayes. Uh, your ability to uh draw these analogies before this committee is very impressive indeed. Uh, from Laredo, Texas, Mayor Saul Ramirez. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Hon honorable members of the subcommittee. I'm Saul Ramirez, Mayor of the City of Laredo, Texas, a community of 130,000 on the U.S.-Mexican border. And I come before you today to strongly support the passage of the Local Partnership Act of 1991, as introduced by you, Mr. Chairman, and co-sponsored by uh, our Congressman Albert Bustamante. Ever since federal revenue sharing was terminated in 1986, cities in our great country have been overburdened to carry out more and more mandates with less and less federal financial resources. Some pretend it's local autonomy or self-determination of municipalities. Others call it infringement on states' rights. However, it can be hardly called this since the federal government continues to pile on new guidelines and requirements with no financial resources or local flexibility to implement them. Cities preferred the old partnership of new laws with some resources versus new laws with no resources and only new deadlines to implement them. In 1986, when the city of Laredo, as most municipalities, suffered great losses to basic services when revenue sharing um, which revenue sharing had assisted in purchasing such things as capital equipment for fire and police protection, as well as equipment for public works. After its demise, new taxes and user fees had to be implemented just to meet the minimum demands, while other city programs had to be curtailed or scratched completely. In a port city such as Laredo, with its close proximity to Mexico, the city has less equipment and manpower to cope with international problems related to the environment, infrastructure demands related to international commerce, and drug enforcement activities to combat the importation of illegal drugs from Mexico and other Latin American countries. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, these are, own, these are not easy tasks to achieve. In the environmental arena, the city is now having to cope with new federal mandates such as the amended Clean Water Act requirement, requiring the EPA uh, to promulgate regulations establishing a national pollutant discharge elimination system. These regulations establish a permit application uh, requirements for stormwater drain, drainage associated with industrial activity and discharges from municipal storm water sewer systems serving populations greater than 100,000. This application process and anticipated capital expenditures will be both expensive and costly. We recognize this. We know it's necessary. What we don't know is where the money is going to come from to pay for such programs. This, these new requirements are only one of a long line of unfunded federal mandates which are hypocritical 
in that EPA has failed to address the cleanup of the Rio Grande River, which is the most polluted river in the United States and is endangering the health of 3.5 million residents from El Paso to Brownsville, Texas. Until recently, more than 20 million gallons of raw sewage were being dumped into the Rio Grande by our sister city of Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, every day. While, the, while this new non-funded mandate eliminate or confine pollution to the Mex will these new non-funded mandates eliminate or confine pollution to the Mexican side of the river? I dare say not. Will the legislation proposed in the Local Partnership Act be instrumental to assist us with new and old program dictates? I am sure that most municipalities will respond with a resounding yes. Cities need the assistance and the revenue to not only cope, but to produce for you. In Laredo, Texas, at our bridge crossings, federal import duties collected amounted to an astonishing $176 million in fiscal year 1990 alone. That went to the U.S. and nothing to the local treasury. However, all, the re all these revenues producing traffic for the federal government, almost 3,000 tractor trucks crossing our bridges daily with a sizable number of overweight Mexican trucks does, not, does make shambles of our streets and our corresponding infrastructure. The Local Partnership Act will be important to cities in that it will force the reality of not only regulatory input but financial responsibility of the federal government. For if not, we have the cities, uh, the cities have, look, have to look forward in the future. We have recycling legislation, Americans with Disabilities Act mandates, more environmental and tra transportation regulations whose intent is clear and proper but whose funding mechanism will stare at the eyes of an already groggy local taxpayer and strapped city budget. The, the pendulum has swung 180 degrees. Now it's the local citizens that are tired of increased property taxes, user fees and sales taxes that in our case go mostly to the state. Of the $73 million collected in in annual sales taxes out of the city of Laredo, only nine million stay in our community. Even locally financed general obligation bonds are stripped of their effectiveness by being s subject to federal taxes if not spent in a two-year time period. Along with all these uh, things, cities are now having to help the state with their deficits as we are in Texas, while not receiving our fair share of the tax dollar. As an example, additional mandated landfill user fees will now obligate our city to pay the state $225,000 a year, up from $60,000 a year ago, to bury our own garbage at our own expense. Is, is this really fair to cities? At this rate, how can we afford basic and rudimentary services to our citizens? We therefore ask you to provide us, the cities, with the means to meet our local mandate requirements concurrently with our country's foreign policy responsibilities. Adequate city services produce good, healthy citizens who must not be forgotten, for it's the citizens that will continue to keep our ideals strong and our country great. Thank you very much, and if you have some questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you, Mayor Ramirez. We do have some questions, and I recognize the gentleman from Wyoming, Craig Thomas. Thank you all for a very important contribution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just take a second, but I do need to to leave. I appreciate very much your, your being here and, and your comments. I too have served in local government, both in the legislature and the state the school board and so on. So I'm totally sympathetic with what you're talking about, but not many of you have talked about how we're going to do it. So let me, I want to share with you, and you know that you have the same problem when your departments and your commissions come to you and want more money for the library and so on, and, and you don't have it. Uh, you got the very same thing. The payments, as a matter of fact, to the states uh, have gone up over the last 10 years from $583 billion to over a trillion. So the payments are not down. The expending is not down. They have gone in programs. I guess the question you'll have to ans answer to yourselves is, uh, how do we do that? Do we start putting all that into a fund and send it for local folks to decide? I, I pretty much support that. But the fact is, we keep wanting more. We talk about the economy. Uh, what uh, People want the federal government to do something about the economy. Reducing taxes is usually one of the things that has to be done. You mentioned SNLs. I wasn't here when SNL started. Do you want to not have the depositors get paid when your SNL goes out? I don't think so. 
You talk about defense. The gentleman from Philadelphia doesn't want to close the Philadelphia shipyard, does he? All I'm saying to you is you know how tough some of these things are. Someone uh, who maybe represents several, tell me about categorical grants. What do you want to do with those? Would you rather transfer those into, into block grants? My friend from Seattle, is it? And then? It's Spokane. Spokane. That's reasonably close. close yeah. uh, and, <laughs> and really, we're all part of the, the same state anyway. I guess that it's very easy to sit here and say, yes, we hear what you're saying. But I think that what's more important is that perhaps you hear what, what we're saying. It is true that money to states has, in fact, increased. But just because it goes to the states does not mean that it goes to local governments. I can show you that in the last decade, federal support to local government has decreased 75 percent. And at the same time, the amount of mandates has increased disproportionately in terms of what we have to fund. The very fact that you would fund this particular partnership even if we took all of the money that is earmarked for the partnership, it would not even pay one half of the complete construction for wastewater cleanup that has been mandated by the federal government. And, and, and that's really our problem. Now, in terms of, of block grants and, and specific programs, the only thing that I can say in terms of that is the block grant program is one of the best programs that we have. I mean, it's a program that we have managed to fight for and, and to So protect. you would generally favor taking current programs that are categorically funded and put them into block grants? I don't want to be put in a position where I have to pit one program against but another. But we are. See, well. Uh, we are. You can take the total defense spending out of it, and we still have a deficit. And I'm not being argumentative. I, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying you need to share in a little of the fun. Come over this afternoon and watch the vote on foreign aid. And, and it may be interesting for you to, to know that the National League of Cities, in probably one of the most brutal discussions that I have ever been a, a part of, categorically, overwhelmingly, by whatever percentage almost literally you wish to pick, voted to raise taxes. And that wasn't easy. And we face, you know, uh, as it was indicated here, I mean, I am a Republican in our community. And our community doesn't like taxes any more than anybody else. But as we look at the problem, I mean, right now we're out of balance for 1992, $3 million. And there isn't one person on my council that believes that we can balance our budget by reducing our utility tax rate. I mean, that just doesn't happen. That would, ma that would make the problem worse. So that we, we think we've been real, very realistic. And we'll take the message back. I mean, we'll help you. Sure. And to say that we'll, we'll increase the taxes. Well, I'm going to stop because there's more. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate your, your problem. I appreciate I just want to ask you to participate with us in finding some, some resolution. For instance, Mr. Cooper, you, if we don't change it in West Orange, change to be a township, if my information is correct, so they could get more money the last time there was a sharing. And we can't do that. They're twice as affluent as yours, and they ended up getting more money and you getting less. Now, you can't do that kind of stuff. Isn't that correct? Let me say uh, to you, Congressman, that one of the things we must recognize is that when people write rules, they write rules for many reasons. And I just want to touch upon the SNL note that you made for a moment. Uh, yes, the people who invested their money ought to get paid, but the people who invested America's money in the SNLs should have monitored the SNL so we didn't have to worry about paying those people when they got ripped off. And I think that needs to be said. I think it's going to be said that when we talk about rules, again, that we not apply the rules at the end of the game, but at the beginning of the game. And, and that's what frustrates mayors and people at the local level, because once again, uh, you're talking about being on the front line. You go tell a person who's not eating, does not have a house to live in, that we must do the noble thing and worry about the investor at the SNL, and the person tells not you, well, the investor, Mr. Mayor, the depositor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Cooper. the depositors, rather, Mr. Mayor, we don't have any money to deposit anyway, so who comes first? I understand. So I, I respect what you're saying, but I just want you to know that we're up against a different kind of a fight, and we're often the ones that are left to explain the mistakes that are made, and then we began to explain those mistakes in terms of the victims. What about those people who walked away with pockets full of money? I think that's the question America's got to answer. Of course. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, Craig, I, I want you to know that we're not trying to play the game of uh, having you choose between the block grant money, if, you, if you're still receiving any, 
uh, versus uh, the uh, Local Partnership Act provisions. I don't think that we have to draw that kind of scenario. And I, I want to make that clear that you, you, don't, you don't have to go back to that kind of decision. The second thing I, I want to talk about is that this money is not something that doesn't exist. We're talking about a total United States appropriation for 1993 of, of $511 billion. And within that, uh, under the Graham Rudman Hollings uh, budget agreements that we are working under, we have a domestic appropriations resource of $198 billion. Now that means that within the $198 billion pot, we have to make some decisions. Uh, but that's all we do anyway. If there wasn't any uh, Local Partnership Act, we would still be making decisions. The question is where on the ladder of priorities does this aid to cities and villages and counties come in the decision-making process that we 535 national legislators have to, to decide? And I would like to just make, uh, volunteer one suggestion because the first appropriation for the Local Partnership Act is really a measly $2 billion. So that's $2 billion out of $198 billion. Now, if I may volunteer a, 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 a source for that money, is that since the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Program, very important, but gets $14 billion out of the $198 billion pot. Now, if you ask me, as, as uh, Mayor Hayes said when he saw uh, $4 million worth of uh, uh, ammunition going off at one round, if you ask me, would I be willing to cut $2 billion out of NASA's program to give all of you the beginning part of $2 billion, if I cut two billion out of their 14 billion, tell me, would the earth stop, start rotating on its axis or would, the, would we have a meltdown in Washington, D.C.? I, I want to tell you this, I don't think anybody outside of NASA would even notice it. So we, it isn't that we have to look at the deficit to worry about two billion dollars or worry about raising taxes. We're not here for that kind of discussion. I want all of you to begin this financial study with me because we're going to all make it together. We're going to agree, and there are other candidates, I'm not picking on the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, but if you can tell me that their $14 billion appropriation can't be cut by $2 billion, leaving them with $12 billion, uh, I would be very surprised. There are other candidates, but we've got inside of the domestic appropriations $198 billion bucks. Now all I'm saying is that I'm going to review all of those programs that are getting that much money and take $2 billion to put into our local partnership act. I think that's doable. It doesn't require suspending the budget agreement. It doesn't require violating the Graham Rudman Holling Law. It doesn't require going into any more debt. It requires us deciding where the priorities are. Now, if there is, and, and there may well be a, a member of this body that says, Look, uh, NASA deserves every nickel of that money. They deserve $14 billion, and in our judgment, the local and county entities deserve zero. That's a decision 
that uh, may not be rational or uh, may not be ha uh, one that I would, would gleefully join in with, but that's the kind of decisions we make. Well, we, we put $289 billion into the military budget in peacetime. Are you telling me that we can't now take $2 billion after listening to all of you and many more that would like to testify that that's too much money? Well, that's what we're deciding. It is not a highfalutin financial uh, mystical operation. It's very, very basic. It's, it's just like the kinds of decisions that you're making every single day. Mayor Hayes? Mr. Chairman, uh, to, to go along with what you're saying to, and to give you an example, the housing director of, of, uh, of North Little Rock came to me uh, two weeks yeah. ago. And he told me that uh, a, an instance that he was really pleased hey, would with. Would you say that on the record? I, I mentioned I don't disagree with you. And I think that's uh, exactly what we need to do. But you all, and you understand very well, that you have to give up something to do something else. That's and, right. and, uh, and that's what we do. I might tell you, however, I've heard 17 different uh, people wanting to take it out of defense in the last day and a half. So. Thank well, you, we may get a majority then before the, this, this thing is over. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse, uh, uh, excuse our discussion. We, we operate uh, rather informally sometimes in the committee. <laughs> Not at all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my housing director for the city of North Little Rock came to me and told me of a church group that had asked him, and he ga gave his permission, for that church group to come down and spend two or three days in one of our projects uh, uh, in order to... Uh, somewhat train themselves for missionary work in South America that they were going to go down and spend two or three months uh, this past summer. And he asked that, uh, that church leader, uh, why don't you spend the two or three months in that project? Uh, because not to say that the, you know, the community that you're going to out of this country is not in need, but I can assure you that the combat zone, I know and I think I probably speak for most public housing, uh, is indeed that is, is if there is a trench, uh, the trench is the deepest in, in our public housing and, and communities all across this country. So what you are saying, I certainly second, and that is obviously we all have to make priority choices. And in the current climate of, of, the, of the citizens that we all represent, uh, feeling that they have indeed been hit too hard and too long and too often, uh, that those choices are going to have to be based on, on a need, and that need is not going to be a pleasant one to decide. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Mink. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, and I certainly uh, applaud your coming here and presenting your testimony. It's going to mean a great deal in helping to fashion this legislation. My own feeling is that the needs of this country in so far as the infrastructure, the need to comply with all of the standards that have been imposed upon you by the federal government in terms of sewers and water lines and underground storage tanks for gasoline stations and so forth, should have been fashioned in such a way that the, uh, either the federal government came up with matching funds to make it possible or to require that state governments come forward knowing full well that the local communities had to bear the basic burdens. Mr. Chairman, I don't uh, take uh, the idea uh, necessarily that we have to find the money from the domestic agenda because my own view is that the neglect of our local communities, of our counties and our townships is a national crisis that requires us to look at our priority and consider this a matter of national security. It's not a case of saying what do we reorder in our domestic agenda, but to come forward with a mandate which says that this is a matter of survival and existence of our own country. We are letting it fall apart, literally. We are abandoning our local communities for the sake of a national defense structure which no longer can be justified. Two, as I was saying to my colleague here, two B-2 bombers will meet this 
first year as a requirement, which is too little in my own estimation for a start. So I don't think that it's fair for this committee or for any member of, of the Congress to put upon you the responsibility of saying where the money is going to come from. I think it's self-evident. My concern is that we look <coughs> carefully at the formula which is structured in the bill. And that is the question I would like to present any of you who would like to comment. Have you had time to look at the formula which this bill uh, sets forth? And do you have any specific comments as to whether the formula is fair in terms of uh, deciding exactly how much your communities are to receive and uh, whether the splits are fair, whether the emphasis is fair, whether the effort index which is listed is fair and any thoughts you have in that direction would help me in looking at the formula too and deciding whether it's fair overall for all of our local communities. Mayor Cooper. Yes, thank you very much, um, Congresswoman Mings. Appreciate the fact that you said that the onus ought not be on us to tell them where to find the money, but I think we all accept that challenge because I think we know what you know. And, and, and you're absolutely right. The domestic agenda has been ignored. And, and I know that we're a great country and we've done great things abroad, but there's a sense of purpose and belonging when you do something at home. Charity, they say, begins at home. So I thank you for those comments. My only concern in my comments I made about the formula that I think we ought to give some consideration, and I'm not sure the answer is to this, but give some consideration to when we talk about the unemployment rate in particular states, because you will have high pockets of unemployment that exist in certain areas, and you will not have the same level of unemployment existing in another area. Uh, we might need to take a look at that and see if there is any other possibility. Are you suggesting that we look at it county by county? rather than the statewide figures for unemployment? Well, I would think that if we look at it county by county, we would get a closer picture. Uh, people uh, have a tendency, if you will, what's going on, at least from my observation, is that you will find counties, for example, in New Jersey, uh, the most urban counties uh, have the most difficult problems and have uh, the larger number of people who are unemployed, Essex County being the largest in the state of New Jersey, for example, whereas that you go to Bergen County, which is right next door, the richest county, or close to being the richest county in the state, so the unemployment numbers would be different. You would also have where the jobs are located within the state. Certain jobs are located within certain regions, and as a result of that, the unemployment rate is not as high as it is in other regions of any particular state. So I think we could, in fairness to, um, to all people within that state, if you looked at it on a county by county basis, it might make better sense in terms of a better formula. Any uh, others want to comment on that? Yeah, That's I'll, exactly my thinking about the formula. Yes, Congressman uh, uh, Mink the, and Mr. Chairman, the, the formula does need to be adjusted in that respect, and I concur wholeheartedly. In as much as, say, for example, in Texas, there's an overall unemployment rate of 6%. Then you go along the border region from El Paso to Brownsville with Laredo being right in the middle of the Rio Grande Basin and you've got uh, El Paso at 14% unemployment, Laredo at 8% and then you get down to McAllen at 16 and, and, and Brownsville at 18% unemployment but yet the whole state is at 6% and so that uh, I would wholeheartedly agree that the formula itself is pretty well intact with what it used to be in, in the past except that it would target uh, and would be a, a lot more equitable if we were to, to look at it on a county per county basis and, and, and take that into consideration. How would, uh, how would we factor in the uh, people who are no longer counted in determining the unemployment rate because they simply have given up, there are no jobs available where they live, they're on welfare, how will we factor in that element which is an enormous part of uh, uh, some of the portions of my state that I represent. Yeah, I, I think that in that respect, uh, I'm sure m m the chairman will come up with, with something that's feasible, but say for example in Laredo where we do also have a lot of people that are on welfare that do receive uh, aid from the federal government uh, in, in different ways, that that also has to be taken into consideration somehow because it does not uh, truly reflect uh, that 8% 8, 8 unemployment does not really reflect the total amount of unemployed that we actually have 
there in Laredo, Texas. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, just from the perspective of the National League of Cities, we would like to say that we believe that the formula is fair, but the targeting portion is a very key element. We would really like to go on record as just saying that whatever you can do, and we certainly concur with the unemployment and the, that sort of rationale for the targeting relationship. Also, it, it is important to realize, I think, that the population factor already is taken into account in the targeting. That may alleviate some of the problems that, that occur when people fall off of the unemployment rolls. Mr. Chairman, if I could just two quick comments. One that I think somehow the committee ought to take into consideration is because I note that uh, that although the U.S., whoever the director of the U.S. Census was, declined to include uh, a, a, what I believe to be a significant adjustment for population shifts, uh, not shifts, but numbers in terms of, of the homeless and, uh, and some minorities that perhaps were undercounted, that, that those are the people that demand and need and of right ought to enjoy a tremendous amount of services and that they are indeed uh, reflective of what our communities need to pay attention to. But because of the population and because of the stand of the Census Bureau, uh, we don't enjoy those numbers in, in any kind of reflection of what we have to serve. So somehow I think that, that what I believe to be the true census count, uh, as, as was recommended uh, through that Bureau, except to the director, ought to somehow be considered in, in that. There ought to be, in addition, one other thing, some flexibility for special types of revenue sources. And to give an example, my community owns its own electric distribution system. Uh, that, because of, of uh, the way we're able to operate that and because of our rates, uh, do provide uh, a, the second largest single source of income for our city's general fund. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily be attributable as just a taxing uh, figure, although it in eff essence and somewhat is. So there ought to perhaps be, as, as all communities are different, some flexibility in the guidelines with some determination by an administrative agency that would give that flexibility some true reflection of the actual impact on its citizens. Mr. Chairman, does the formula include anything with respect to the uh, indebtedness of these uh, local entities as a measure of uh, index? We have a a tax index, but do we measure their ability to do anything more uh, from the debt factor? And if not, why not? Maybe uh, we can answer that later. I just, I'm just curious. I'm just trying to see what factors we might put into the formula. Well, we have tried to grow from the experience of, uh, of uh, the 1970s revenue sharing, revenue sharing mm -hmm. program. And what we have done is take uh, state factors and then a breakdown within the states to try to target uh, some of the considerations that you've raised. The uh, nearest two that come uh, close to the, the, the discussion that's uh, presently underway is that the per capita income of a county uh, would be counted in, and there we would pick up people who were welfare, unemployed, uh, who would have been in the unemployed rates if they had actually been seeking a job, and we try to, to, to uh, compensate uh, for that in, in that respect. We also look at the tax effort, which is about as close as we can come to Mayor Her Hayes' uh, consideration of uh, of how much uh, and, and additional uh, items and contributions, uh, initiatives that are local uh, that might be, be made. Uh, we have wrestled with uh, putting the unemployment uh, uh, factor in a, a further breakdown within the states. And I uh, read you loud and clear because that is the single most sensitive item. Uh, in the state breakout, though, we do have unemployment, per capita income, population, urbanization, income taxes, tax effort itself, and total taxes. Uh, so that we're, what we're trying to do is uh, take into consideration these uh, statewide considerations and then the uh, population the per capita income, and the tax effort within the state breakout. 
so that those changes in figures would pick up the uh, cities and counties that are, that are suffering more, that hi have higher unemployment, and that have people earning, uh, on an average, less money. Uh, we Chairman. want to uh, revisit this, and this is an important, very important uh, a discussion that we're having, because the formula, of course, is, is going to be the, the, the engine that drives this whole process of partnership payments. And Mayor the income Ramirez. tax question that, that, that you just mentioned as one of the seven that you've outlined in that first phase of the funding of the entire act, uh, that that is a state income tax. Is that what you're referring to? No, no. The, the state is a pass-through in this uh, bill. The state Completely. No, no state no, can benefit, okay. but let the me, formula. Okay, yeah. but let, me, let me then add, uh, ask this then. If, say, for example, uh, again, Laredo, uh, which if you took uh, income tax returns out of Laredo as, as, uh, as uh, one of the criteria, uh, wouldn't fare as well as if you said, if you took into consideration the generating uh, source that it is for the federal government as a port, like other cities may be, uh, as uh, generators for income, for, uh, for the federal government. Like I mentioned earlier in my testimony, just this last year alone, uh, with the duties that, that, that were collected from the federal government, they totaled almost $176 uh, million dollars out, of our, out of our community. And, and they, they've been steadily growing every year, but, but uh, the, it's taxing our infrastructure tremendously. And so if you took income tax as, as one of the criteria, uh, it wouldn't fare as well as if you said, well, because of the demands that, that, it, that it places on a community that is a revenue generating community outside of income tax uh, for the federal government, that that may also be a point of consideration in distributing these funds. Uh, that's something that, that we haven't considered. Uh, there would probably be few localities that would, would be in the unique position that you've described since Laredo is a, a, a border uh, city. But remember, uh, when we talk about the tax effort within the local, uh, the local within the state and in the cities, in the counties, uh, we're talking about the taxes uh, that, that are being levied upon you as opposed to the taxes that are, that are coming out of that locality that are federally derived. Uh, what you would like to do is, is be able to get some benefit from, from that position, wow. and it, it might be uh, difficult. I, I concede that this has not been given consideration. And, and the same thing with uh, other border communities, if you took uh, the, the sales tax that, that we generate, Laredo alone again, over uh, $79 million last year for one of the poorest uh, per capita income communities in the entire country. And the reason that it shows that is because we have all this uh, um, uh, purchasing going on there along the border that's feeding this new trade that's developing, uh, or additional trade that's developing with our partner to the south. Uh, I'm happy to report that that part of your tax effort would be a consideration for local and counties to, to be a benefit. That would, be, that, would, that would come under this category of tax effort. Because what we're trying to do is reward the people that are doing as much as they can for themselves in the beginning. Uh, what else that may help you is the per capita income locally which I would suspect uh, might be lower than average, and if that's true, that would operate in, in your benefit. Uh, so this discussion is, is exceedingly important. Uh, the formula is different from the uh, revenue sharing program because uh, of, of uh, earlier years, because we've added the unemployment uh, factor but we have added it at the state level. And uh, what I hear you saying is, is let's uh, break it down even further to the county and the city uh, so that there might be even uh, more support uh, coming to those areas that are, that are more uh, hard hit. And I, I welcome this discussion. Could I ask if uh, 
uh, Executive Director Schiff and uh, Coalition on Human Needs Director uh, Vasilov wanted to make any comments on, on any part of our discussions, including the, uh, the questions and answers. There's a seat right in the uh, center, the sir. Um, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> yes, Don Payne. <coughs> Before the um, uh, next person uh, speak, I would just like to, <coughs> excuse me, for the record, correct the um, statement made by uh, Congressman Thomas, who unfortunately has left. He indicated that the amount of funds that are going to counties now or to states uh, is at an all-time high. I have before me a report from the New York Times, December 30th, 1990. Information from the Rockefeller Institute of Government, which I would like to ask to have it made a part of the record. Without objection, so already. That indicates that in 1978, $130 billion were expended uh, by the uh, federal government to aid to, to states. Uh, now, in that breakdown, um, there was about $90 billion of grants uh, that went directly to governors. This is in 1978. In 1990, we're down to $55 billion. In addition to that, though, there has been a, a dramatic increase in the welfare and Medicaid portion. And so the total expenditure for 1990 is $120 billion. But of that $120 billion, $65 billion is for Medicaid and Medicare and welfare. And only $55 billion is going to grants to states. So I think that Mr. Thomas is, 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 is totally uh, off base uh, when you compare $55 billion uh, of direct grants to governments in 1990 as opposed to in excess of 90 billion uh, 12 years ago. That's a tremendous difference. Um, I, and so I'd like to have that added to the, to the record. Well, I thank you very much. This is an important consideration. Uh, uh, Ms. Vassal, Mr. Schiff, would you care to make any comments about uh, the, the, the items that have brought us here today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. My name is Jeff Schiff. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Towns and Townships, an organization which has approximately 13,000 mostly small and mostly rural members across the country. I would like to make two points today in my testimony. One is that most of the 39,000 local governments in America today are very small. Point two, most, most local governments in America today receive no direct federal assistance at all. Point one, what is it that we mean when we say small? Uh, today, of the 39,000 units of government in the United States, 86% of them, 86% of them have populations <coughs> below 10,000 people. 72% uh, of them have populations under 3,000 people, and fully half of all the localities in America have under 1,000 residents today in 1991. That brings with it a lot of baggage. We've heard testimony today to that effect. Limited staff, limited budgets. In fact, the political scientists have developed a new term called a ZEG, a zero employee government, and there are thousands of them across the country. Uh, they rely on volunteers, they rely on part-time officials, they have few of the tools that we normally, especially in Washington, assume a government would have in terms of staff, access to consultants, attorneys, computers, money to travel to training uh, activities and so forth. Uh, and yet they do provide the basic lifeline public services that people cannot provide for their own and do expect a government to provide roads and bridges and snow removal and police and fire and ambulance. These are the baseline economically vital services that members such as mine uh, provide daily. Point two, what exactly do I mean by the lack of federal investment? It is a fact that since the demise of the general revenue sharing program, literally 80 percent, four-fifths of all of America's localities now receive ha no connection, have no connection whatsoever with the federal government uh, except through the mandates which we've heard about today. No money whatsoever. Uh, this drop in the 
financial connection with Washington has, of course, tracked directly with the precipitous growth in mandates uh, over, the, over the years. And I might uh, point out that none of these mandates make any distinction between a size government when they are levied. So the issue that we do not get any money at all, no CDBG, no other kinds of federal investment, coupled with the fact that the mandates have precipitously grown, uh, does exacerbate the problem. Uh, let me say also for the record that we are not, as some might interpret, asking for exemptions from the mandates. We think basically in their kernel, most of them are extremely important public policy. And without them applying in a rational way, or with some investment by the federal government, we are dooming America's small localities to be second class communities uh, where, without the health and safety uh, and environmental protection that others may enjoy. What we have, however, is, as we've heard say this morning, the Congress enacts mandates, but the, does not have the money to pay for them. Local governments do not have the money to pay for them either, especially the small ones, which I point out again, are the majority, the vast majority, of the intergovernmental community, the partnership that you are so interested in. It means then, in another way, that the federal government is relying upon this network of intergovernmental partners to carry out the public policy that it in Washington believes is important for our nation. And yet, they do not give the money and the local governments do not have the money either. What that means, Mr. Chairman, is that we are setting ourselves up for a, an immense set of disasters. Because on the day that there is an, en an environmental tragedy, or on the day where there is a health or safety cataclysm. It will be the day that the federal agency will say, but wait a minute, I wrote regulations to put that mandate into effect. And in fact, some of your colleagues may call a hearing and say, wait a minute, did we not pass a law regarding this environmental problem? The problem is that the underlying bases are unrealistic. They are irrelevant to the facts. And the House of Cards is relying upon a system, a network of partners which does not exist, does not have the wherewithal to carry out the federal mandate. I might also add just briefly that this wouldn't be quite as bad as it is if a landmark piece of legislation enacted by the Congress in 1980 called the Regulatory Flexibility Act of 1980, which would require federal agencies to in fact make distinctions among mandates in their application to the intergovernmental partners, has been completely ignored for its 11 years of existence. In fact, there has never been an oversight hearing in the House of Representatives on that law. You, you've just given me another assignment uh, in the course of this excellent presentation. Well, thank you, sir. I will um, bring myself to a rapid close just now. Uh, I might also say, uh, with all due respect, that in many, re in many cases, the Congress itself is part of the problem because when it enacts some of these landmark legislative packages which have become very popular in the country, it writes them very, very restrictively, very specifically, so that when they arrive at the administering agency, there is in fact much less latitude to in fact design these things, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, acknowledgments of reality that I mentioned before. In addition to that, and in closing, let me say that the states are participating in the problem as well, because especially for smaller ones, they highly restrict in an almost paternalistic manner the kinds of revenue that local governments, small local governments, may enact. In fact, although I do not wish myself to be in the, uh, in the situation that many of our witnesses are in this morning, they are allowed in great measure by the states to have local option sales taxes, to have local option income taxes, by far and away in the United States today, no small local government is allowed by the state to do such things. They are required only to enact uh, property taxes, which of course are the most onerous, inelastic, and hated uh, lo a revenue source uh, across the country. This Local Partnership Act would be money well spent. I don't think anyone here has uh, uh, alleged otherwise, but there will be somewhere along the line. Uh, I was one of the original employees in the Office of Revenue Sharing. Uh, actually, I think my employee number was 003 back in 1972. And I can tell you that for the entire run of that program, the kinds of um, expenditures that went across the board year in and year out, one, two, three, were environmental protection, public safety, and, uh, and, and um, <laughs> environmental protection, public safety, and, oh, I can't remember the third one, but it'll come to me. But 
It is actually the three major kinds of expenditures that we've been talking about today. They provide the physical and human infrastructure to make a community run and to provide the kinds of support to the environmental mandates that, um, that the Congress and everyone else is interested in. So well, this would money you. would be very well spent combined with the closeness to the problems and uh, the needs and the mandates that are there. There's no question in my mind that there would be any frivolity involved in these expenditures. We are so, very grateful for your statement. And let's ask uh, Ms. Vassilov surely. to uh, be the last commentator today. Thank you. I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of the Coalition on Human Needs. The Coalition on Human Needs includes over 100 national religious, civil rights, labor and professional organizations committed to addressing the problems of those Americans most in need. Member organizations of the coalition include associations of service providers, labor unions, membership organizations, and low-income advocacy group. A complete listing of organizations endorsing the principles of the Coalition on Human Needs is included as an attachment to our testimony. I want to commend the chairman on the introduction of the Local Partnership Act of 1991. The legislation represents an important step in restoring the federal government's shared responsibility for critical services and programs at the local level. Member organizations of the Coalition on Human Needs know firsthand that the need for initiatives like the Local Partnership Act is great. Government-funded services have been decimated to the point where the quality of life is deteriorating rapidly for everyone in this country. Our most vulnerable populations, those living in poverty or near the poverty level, experience this decline most acutely. Local governments have experienced a disproportionate share of the burden of dealing with inadequate resources and often desperate human needs that result. Other witnesses have told you about the effects of the fiscal crisis at the local level on their ability to fulfill their responsibilities as elected public officials. I would like to outline in more human terms how these cuts have affected the people who live in these communities. All Americans suffer from the cutbacks in services local governments have been forced to implement due to diminished resources. The Census Bureau recently announced that over 2 million more Americans were living in poverty last year than the year before, representing a rise in the poverty rate from 12.8% in 1989 to 13.5% in 1990. Many of these people live in our nation's cities and townships. In fact, many recent reports have noted the recent trend toward an urbanization of poverty. There is a particular concentration of poor metropolitan dwellers living in central cities, 58.2% according to the Census Bureau report. These people are the ones most seriously affected by cuts in assistance and service programs at the local level. For despite the fact that poverty is up, the number of people serviced by health, housing, nutrition, education, and other programs is down. Every day the headlines report on cuts in services that local governments are compelled to make that most affect people already living with terrible hardships. I'd like to say just a few words about tax fairness. Naturally, the concentration of poor and low-income people in many of our cities diminishes the local government's ability to raise revenue through the tax system. At the same time, the rise of low-wage service sector employment has cut into local tax bases. Oh, Continued Kim. erosion of the tax base contributes to additional cuts in services in a depressing cycle of worsening conditions for residents. Moreover, the revenues raised at the local level are inherently more regressive than revenues raised by the federal government through the income tax system. Sales, excise, and property taxes, as well as user fees, are the revenue sources most relied upon by local governments. These revenue sources impose a far greater burden on poor and middle-income Americans than they do on wealthy individuals. According to the Citizens for Tax Justice, Last year, the poorest fifth of American families spent six times as much of their family income on sales and excise taxes as did the richest 1% of American families. Mr. Chairman, our country is currently experiencing a social deficit, a critical deficiency of public investment in our people and our economic infrastructure. There has been a wholesale retreat on the domestic policy front over the past decade that must be reversed. The serious fiscal problems at the local level brought about in large part by the federal government's abandonment of its shared financial responsibilities is one manifestation of this crisis. Federal participation in a public investment strategy is urgently needed. Enactment of the Local Partnership Act would be a major contribution to this important national priority. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
very much. Uh, it's important that uh, both of you uh, put the concluding analysis on uh, what I think has been a very uh, productive and important hearing. Uh, the, the witnesses uh, have come from all parts of the country, uh, representing all levels of local and municipal government, and uh, I think that this has uh, moved our uh, committee uh, to take expeditious action. Uh, we're going to uh, review very carefully the uh, record that has been made today, the additional documents that have been submitted, and I think the time has come for the Congress uh, to make the kinds of decisions, uh, difficult though they may be, I, I may suggest that they're no, no less difficult than we would uh, be making if there were no Local Partnership Act. Uh, there are always uh, important considerations. We think the uh, urban, local, d domestic, municipal, county uh, support system is exceedingly frayed and that it has to be rebuilt. And this is uh, really, quite frankly, only a very modest beginning. And so you've all been very helpful, Mr. Borovic, Ms. Vasilov, and Mr. Schiff. We thank you. And uh, this uh, hearing is concluded. That concludes today's hearing of the House Government Operations Committee as it examined the fiscal condition of America's local governments. For more information, write to the committee at 372 Rayburn House Office Building in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. And we have this programming note. If you missed any portion of this hearing, C-SPAN 2 will play it again in its entirety, beginning at 425 a.m. Eastern Time, 125 a.m. for our West Coast viewers. The C-SPAN 2 schedule is available to viewers 24 hours a day. For the latest information about our program,